All right, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Coltish Entering the Kingdom of the Colts. My name is Jeremiah Roberts. I am one of the co-hosts here. I'm here as always, and uh, I'm actually face to face with you. I'm between our guests uh, yeah. and the super sleuth of the show. What's up? Uh, we are here uh, right outside Nashville, Tennessee, in Lebanon, Tennessee. Uh, we're talking earlier. It's funny. There's a couple of little cities here that are named after. Uh, you know, even like Middle Eastern countries, there's a place in Arizona called Baghdad, for example. Yeah. And we're here in Lebanon, Tennessee. But um, I am super excited because uh, we are currently at the uh, Fight Laugh Feast event here in Nashville, Tennessee. It's been a great day, a lot of great content. There's been a lot of people coming up to us. People that a lot of you, you know, listen in. And it's always a really cool to see um, really the face behind the people who listen to our podcast and how it's blessed them, how it's affected them. So uh, this is our first on the road live podcast but we are talking about <clears throat> today the church of christ we've got a lot of we've gotten a lot of requests before to do that and you know we've always want we always want to find the right conversation the right guest and uh we are here with trey and how are you doing man i'm doing good glad to be here awesome man and so uh just so you know too uh i first met you at um you were actually at apologia studios and you were uh, you're from louisiana and you were interested, and you were interested in getting involved in end abortion now, uh, helping your church to be involved to stop the murder of babies. Very admirable. And and you, I just happened to be in the studio, and you talked to me a, a little bit about uh, your experience, your involvement in the Church of Christ. So just tell everyone, just real quickly, um, so they can hear you. Just tell them about your uh, what makes you someone to be an expert on the subject of hand of what we're going to talk about today yeah. about the Church of Christ. Okay. Well, first of all, thanks for letting me be here. Okay. And. Um, you know, when, when you're going to do a podcast on the Church of Christ, I really, I'm glad that I get to do it. I really, I want to do it um, because I want to give a fair assessment of the Church of Christ, not just someone who's mad and angry and hurt. Right. You know, I want to give some of, of what they believe, why they believe what they believe. Uh, but I was, I got into the Church of Christ in January 20th of 1998, mm. and I was in it for 18 years. Mm. Um, so Phil Robertson from Duck Dynasty is, is, was my mentor. Uh, for those 18 years in the Church of Christ. Um, went to his church, love him to death, still do, learned a ton from him. Um, and one of the things that I learned the most from him is to be bold, you know? Right. And so um, I feel like I am that. Uh, <laughs> but love him to death, and we can go into more details of, of things later on in the road, uh, down the road. But um, yeah, that, that would I would say that's my qualification, being discipled by one of the top guys in the church of Christ, you know, mm -hmm. you'd say, but, um, for 18 years. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's very interesting. And this is the point too, where you talk about theology matters, um, just because we're going to delve really focus in on the, the theology. So if you're listening in to, if you're someone who's listening in, you're a member of, of the church of Christ and say you're, maybe you're, you're in close proximity to the Robertson family is that, you know, this is not about anyone's, uh, character or, any, or anything right. of that nature. We, we are talking specifically in regards to what are the theological beliefs, because one of the things we always talk about in regards to uh, cultish, and it's in my uh, my uh, Your shirt. Piece, my shirt here, uh, bad theology hurts people, and there is an aspect to it we're going to unravel is that a distortion of biblical good theology in regards to especially a soteriology, salvation, how are you made right with God, and that distortion of that ends up creating a burden on. Uh, people are really a, a bad yoke, and that's we're going to go ahead and ravel that. So maybe start from the beginning. Uh, just uh, in regards to uh, just the first topic we're going to focus in on, um, just historically, what do you know about the Church of Christ? I mean, you were involved for a yeah. long time. Yeah. Can you just give a brief summary of where they came from and how they started? Yeah, so they started in the early 1800s, 1830s uh, in Kentucky. Uh, Thomas and Alexander Campbell, uh, they were, you know, Church of Christ, people were called Campbellites. Yeah, you know, maybe not so much today, but that's what they were known as Campbellites. Uh, they're part of the Restoration Movement. Okay, so when you think about the Restoration Movement, is you have Mormons, Jehovah's Witness, Seventh Day Adventist, Church yeah. of Christ, right? Um, you can say Pentecostal, 1901, right? Uh, but these are the Restoration Movements, and so when you think about what the Restoration Movement was about, I mean, it was to restore the one true Church, and this is mm. why all of those groups have always had this stigma that they think they're the only ones going to heaven. Right. Right? And it's because they did believe that, that, mm -hmm. that they have restored the one true church. All the other churches, all the Christians went apostate, and they, have the one, they are the ones that restored it, right, to what it's supposed to be. 
And so um, that's the original roots of it. Um, any, what was the other question? Yeah, I think, well, that just get, just kind of get an idea of where it came from. And that's just yeah. one of the commonalities of the different groups we cover here at Cultish are groups that they talk about. There was, a, there was knowledge that was hidden from a long time ago. And that was gone. It was, mm-hmm. The gospel is lost. And now all of a sudden we've now restored it. There's been a restoration. You see mm-hmm. that in Mormonism or even just in general when you talk about, uh, even when you talk about like Gnosticism or a lot of the Gnostic cults or even when we deal with aspects of New Age, it's this now this hidden knowledge has been recovered. This right. idea of their perception of what the gospel is yeah. has been hidden for a long time, and now they've recovered it. And this is, it's exclusive to the Church of Christ. Right. Um, so that's just something to bear in mind. What would you have in mind? Well, I was just thinking <clears throat> one neat little fact is that the Campbells wouldn't even be allowed to be members of the Church of Christ today because they came from the Presbyterian background, hmm. and they were baptized as infants, yeah. and they never were rebaptized into the Church of Christ. And so mm. to have a a belief that you have to be baptized in order to be saved. Wow, okay. And absolutely not infant baptism, then Thomas and Alexander Campbell wouldn't even be Church of Christ members today. So did that did that doctrine develop later on in time? Yeah. Okay. I, I I guess. I mean I mean I think that, you know, they started preaching that from the beginning. And just like, look, I really believe when you study the history of it, and they got a lot of their philosophy from Francis Bacon. Okay. Mm. And so we'll talk about that maybe in a second. But if you really look at I think that the heart behind the Campbells and Barton Stone who started, I think they had really good intentions because they're looking around and they're seeing all these different divisions and they're like, man, let's not have divisions. You know, let's all come together. But then when you had Francis Bacon and his philosophy that, that you can come to something with a clean slate and not be bent one way or the other. Right? Yeah. So that's, they took that philosophy with them and they said, Hey, let's just go by the Bible and let's get rid of all the creeds and all the confessions. And let's just go strictly by the Bible. Right. So they got rid of all these creeds and confessions. And so they say, we have no creed but the Bible. But the funny thing is, that's a creed, right? right? Yeah. And we speak where the Bible speaks, we're silent, we're silent. Well, that's a creed, you know? And so by doing that and saying, we're going to start all over and get rid of all the creeds, all the confessions, the historical church and what the people said before us, the church has always said before us about things. What you did is you just got rid of over 1,800 years of church history right. that God, Jesus Christ, has protected the flock and shepherded his sheep through history. You got rid of that, and you just started heresies back over. Yeah, you pretty much said that all of it is incorrect. Yeah. Yeah, because, you know, Jesus says, apostate. yeah, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. The gates of hell we know are on defense. And then Jude says, earnestly contend for the faith that was once for all mm-hmm. delivered to the saints. However, they have to, in order to create their own doctrine that's uh, antithetical to the Bible, they have to say, well, we got to throw all the creeds, the confessions out of the, out of the window so we can start new. Start with a mm-hmm. clean slate. And starting your own creeds and confessions. <laughs> right. You know? Right. Yeah. And, uh, and that's another thing. You know, Jude, verse 3, um, contend for the faith. For the faith. Fight. Contend. Fight, right? yes. These are boxers or contenders. They, they fight. And yeah. so yeah. we're called to do that. We're, we're called to fight and to contend for the true gospel, the historical Christian faith that was delivered to us, you know, once for all. And so, I mean, a lot of people see that as bad and not good, not nice, you know? Right. But I see it as... Our calling is to defend the faith, yeah. you know, in love. So, yeah, and, and that's a big thing too. And just jumping back to when you talk about the uh, the Robertson clan, the Robertson family, is that I don't. I've actually have never watched a show. Uh, mm-hmm. No, not not. I haven't watched a full episode. I've seen it when I'm flipping channels, and I think everyone sort of knows who they are. That you know, they're, they're the long haired, uh, bearded guys. You know, right. Some beards are longer than others. Some ones are a little bit more gray than others. And I think the, I remember like their big. You know, we're talking about right now. We're in 2021, which has been a, and it's been another wild and crazy year. There's a lot going on uh, right now in the news. But um, you know, I think when we're talking specifically about cancel culture, they were one of the first people to kind of experience that when one of the uh, older it was, uh, Phil. it was Phil. Yeah, yeah. He he made some. I forget the specific comments that he made, but there was media backlash. Um, his show, I guess he got suspended. Right. And it was, you know, everyone was doing the I stand with Phil. And, yeah. and it was the first time it, that sort of cancel culture thing happened. I remember that's where I first found out about them. That's, yeah, I've never thought about that, but I, I think he might have been the first canceled person. Hmm. Really? I, I mean, I can't remember yeah. anybody before that. I mean, he really did stand hey. up for God's word and, you know, against. He rolled with it. I remember know, that. I admired him for that. And listen, that's what I love about Phil. You know, for what he believes, he will not back down. I right. Mean, he is bold. And I, I love that about Phil. I learned that from him. I love him to death. You know, yeah. I just disagree with him on some scriptural 
some serious yeah, and doctrinal I, things. And I think it's true. It's true too. I mean, we're here. At, we're here in Tennessee, and uh, you know, we're at we're at the the Phi Left East conference, and you think about some of the content that they're, they're talking about. It's very, in many ways, very politically focused because we believe that the lordship of Christ entails all areas of life, including the the political realm. But <laughs> what's interesting about I think just the allure and the appeal of the Robinson family, just to the conservative movement in general. He said Robinson. He did it again. Robert, oh, did I Robert Robertson. Robertson. Family. Robertson. <laughs> we're, talking about Swiss, we're talking about <laughs> okay. Louisiana redneck Robertson. That's, okay. It's not Swiss family Robinson. Oh, I still love that. I love that movie, by the way. <laughs> I, want, I, want to get, I don't want to get distracted. But, you know, talking about really the, a lot of the conservative movement today is almost a secular conservatism where they are appealing. It's really based around like vague, general family values, belief in God, you know, without really defining who God is or believing in the con- you know, the constitution's the final authority without really giving an ultimate accounting to why that is the ultimate authority, where that derives from in relate in regards to the law of God. But my point mm-hmm. in being is that I think when you look at the appeal that the Robinson clan has Robertson, oh my gosh, uh, Robertson <laughs> clan has, I'm going to get butcher life here, but um, just the appeal that they have in yeah. that movement, because when you look at what they believe, there's not really an examination, intricate detail of when they talk about God, the gospel, salvation, what does that entail? What we always want to do at cult is that we want to be fair. Uh, we want to make sure we define our terms. Mm-hmm. And there, when you look at some of the things that the Robertsons will yeah. talk about. Yeah. There we go. And they'll they'll talk about these things, you know, vaguely about following God and give an example. Just give an example of some of their sermons that the average person would hear, and then may, then we can maybe def- go get into defining terms. So you mentioned the one sermon that is very popular. I think you sent to me a while back. Talk, yeah. talk about that. Well, I mean, you know, so here. He, I mean, it's, it's it's biblical, right? It's in the Bible, yeah, yeah. right? It's in the Bible, but it's it's a it's a it's a gospel where this is why I tell people like when you didn't know the good news, the real good news, the fullness of the good news of Jesus Christ. If you don't know that, then it's pretty good news. Mm-hmm. It's the best news you've heard so far because mm. this news is like okay, you you grew up and you eventually sinned, yeah. right? And God exists, and He sent His Son to live on this earth perfectly, and He died, and He was buried, and He rose again, yeah, and if you want to live forever, right? If you want to live forever, then mm-hmm. you need to repent of your sins and get baptized, baptized yeah. right? And be baptized into the death, burial, and resurrection of him, you know, and through water baptism. And once you do that, then you are saved and you receive the forgiveness of sins. And that's when you receive the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And so, but you can also lose your salvation. And so you got to watch how you live after that. So then it's just, it's a workspace. It's, it's this, this, yoke of works on you that just you never know am i in am i out i think i'm in now i'm not now give me a couple weeks let me work that off and then i'm back in it's just it's just works this works based salvation but so i mean that would be yeah you said you said something that really uh pricked my ears so it said you're you're born and then you eventually yeah. sin can you can you explain that in terms of like their doctrines of the yeah. church of christ and so you know when i'm talking to someone in the church of christ um you know, I think when you don't understand, if you've never been in the Church of Christ, you want to talk, you, you know, most people want to attack baptism, right? Because they know yeah. that they're big and baptized. you have to be baptized to be saved. Um, so when I'm talking to a Church of Christ, the first thing I ask them uh, a lot of times um, is, are you a Protestant evangelical, right? And so if any Church of Christ person is listening to this, ask yourself, are you a Protestant evangelical Christian? And they'll say yes, right? They'll say yes, that they are. And so I ask them, what is that? Well, they'll say, well, maybe I'm not a Catholic. Right. You know, and I, I evangelize people, so therefore I'm, a, I'm an evangelical. Yeah. And so if you just Google Protestant evangelicalism, not going into a big you know, theological book, Wikipedia's definition will come up and say it's a global transdenominational religion that believes that you're saved by grace solely through faith alone. And that's what Protestant evangelicals believe. And you ask them, do you believe that? And mm-hmm. they don't. Right? Yeah. They, they don't believe that you're saved by grace through faith alone. They, they believe it's grace through faith plus baptism, right? So right there, you're not a Protestant evangelical, right? And so, you know, the main thing that you really have to, I, I, you, you've got to get straight is that you're born a sinner, and they don't believe that. 
They, they believe hmm. you're Pelagian. It's kind of shocking to people when they hear that. Full, full on Pelagian. Right. You're born perfect. No sinner. Like, you were born absolutely perfect. Yeah. Uh, just real quick, I know, we're, I know we're live here and we can cut the initial podcast and post, but um, just so you know, too, if you want to just uh, on the microphone, just, keep, just have your mouth like closer oh, to that. Oh, my bad. There you go. I know. It's, I, I learned this too the first couple of hours. <laughs> this is a live sort of like, if you want to listen, if, if, by the way, anybody listening and, and if you ever do podcasting, it's one of those things you always want to make sure. It's almost like you're just like kissing the mic. You may kiss the mic. I'm, I may kiss the mic. Yes. <laughs> but anyways, no, that's a really good point. Um, and so I, I think what we want to do is, again, define terms. And again, I want to make sure that we lay a foundation because when we talk about words, you know, we talk about, oh, occult, cultish, or even heresy. That's something that's a loaded word, and especially for someone that, you know, when you think about too, with cultish, we are every single week, you know, as often we drop a podcast, we are really talking about a certain group where mm-hmm. of calling a certain group that represents a lot of people's spirituality and really a core part of the, their identity, we're, we're calling it false. We're calling it yeah. a counterfeit. And right. so, you know, we want to make sure that we do it in a way that's fair, that's level-headed, and is... It defines terms. So I want you, when we say these words, I want you just to think through, you know, look, listen to what we have to say when we define these terms. Uh, so the first thing I want to talk about, and you mentioned just a little bit, um, theologically, just a couple of basic points of the Church of Christ and really the, the foundation of, of what puts them into this category of why we're talking about them today would be uh, something known as Pelagianism. Mm-hmm. Um, and in other words, that this would be, this is an ancient, Christian heresy uh, that was repudiated and refuted by the church. Uh, many a times what you'll see when people think they have a new esoteric secret knowledge or now the, the gospel is lost and now I've recovered it, there a lot of times they're just regurgitating right. something that has just been yeah. Christians throughout history have uh, dealt with and repudiated. So really when we talk about Pelagianism, it's we, some people might call it sinless perfectionism, but in very simplistic blue collar terms, which probably I think the, I think the, the Robertson clan would definitely be representative of the average blue collar person. Um, you know, and I think that's one so of the reasons I. why they, they related. Yeah. And by, by the way, speaking of blue collar, Matt, you have the most like Louisiana blue collar truck. We hung out in there last night. And the fact that inside of your truck, you've got a gasoline can, mm-hmm. some shotgun shells, and just, you know, all the paraphernalia that would represent the middle class. Paraphernalia. <laughs> <laughs> you Interesting know, term. Uh, it very quote, and, quotation terms. So. And so back to what, you know, clarifying terms. Um, I want to clarify when you were talking about cultish. I mean, this yeah. is kind of a shocker. Like, oh, my goodness. You're on cultish podcast talking about the Church of Christ. Um I want to say this and be very clear. There are many great people in the Church of Christ. I, I still love, I mean, just deeply. I have family in the Church of Christ. Um, you know, when you leave the Church of Christ, um, sometimes you are cut off. I mean, a lot of friends. I mean, I've lost a lot of friends. You know, people lose family. I mean, I, I can tell you stories. It's, it's so sad. And we try to work towards reconciliation on those things. But it doesn't happen. But, you know, that's not everybody. You know, mm-hmm. that's not everybody in the Church of Christ. You're not... You're not cut off by everybody thank thank the lord uh, yeah. like i'm asked to have great relationships with my my in-laws are great awesome people my yeah. my wife one of her great friends is is still in the church of christ and she's she saw some of the things that we went through and and she told her look we might believe differently but we'll never separate our friendship because of this you know so you know we're talking about beliefs in the church of christ but not i don't want it to be individuals right mm-hmm. right and so to define those terms you know pelagianism is this, this belief that you're born perfect and that one day you will sin, possibly, mm. possibly, and most likely you will, okay. but you're born perfect as a baby. Yeah, so this is something that will lay a foundation for their view on baptism and ultimately a, a works-based uh, salvation. So, uh, yeah, so I think if you could go ahead and just define for us, um, so specifically, I mean, you're born sinless. Maybe just, maybe kind of go more in depth, explain what that looks like for Someone, someone who's in the mindset of the Church of Christ, what does it look like for them? For someone who's raising a family, you know, it's kind of interesting. You talk about being born sinless. I spend the last couple of days hanging out with you and your lovely wife, Casey. And, you know, and you've got two uh, lovely... Two little sinners. Uh, two little sinners with one <laughs> little sinner on the way in about a month. <laughs> yeah. And so I'm like, well, that, that's a, I think that's kind of a repudiation of, of, of children being born sinless. But when it comes to specifically for the Church of Christ, what does it look like for them uh, culturally and then... 
What are some proof texts of yeah. where they go to? Let, let's, start, let's, let's start to unravel that. Yeah, I, just, I just turned to the, to the text that they would go to. Um, well, it doesn't look like anything. I, I just believe it. I mean, so it's, it's one of those things you just don't think about. You know, you're told that you're born perfect. And yeah. you, if you tell one of them, like, you know, I ran into one the other day at, the, at a restaurant. And we were talking and I mentioned this. And he was just like, no, no, babies have not done anything. What has a baby done? Like, they're, they're, they're perfect. You know, they're sinless. You know? Yeah. And so it's just what you're taught. You don't, you don't think through it. Because if you thought through it, you would think, okay, why do we teach Sunday school to babies and to kids? Why don't they teach us? Right? They're the sinless ones. Yeah. Right? Um, you would think to yourself, why do I have to teach my kids how to be good? Like, why should I need, I, I have to teach my kids to be good. Why? Because they're inherently bad. Right. They're born sinful. Yeah. Right. So it's not, it's just, it's one of those things where, and I'm telling you this from me, and I mean, I'm, I, you just don't think about it. You just believe it. You're told it, you believe it, and it makes sense because you're basing it on logic and reason. You're not basing it on the word of God. But because it is a religion and it, it has its own doctrines, you have to have something to base it on in the Word of God. And so that's where we get to the proof text, right? And so mm-hmm. it would be Romans 7, verses 7, 8, and 9. I'll read it to you. And so you say, apart from law, so this is how it would be explained. This okay. is how it would be explained to you from a church of Christ how you're born perfect. It says right here in Romans uh, chapter um, 7, verses 8 and 9. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. So do you see? So if there's no law, there's no sin. That's, mm-hmm. what, that's how it would be explained. I once was alive apart from the law. So do you see there's a point in your life when if there's no law, there's no sin. So once I was alive apart from the law, which means there was a time in my life where I had no sin. And then it says, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. Yeah. So there, And he didn't die physically because he keeps writing. He died spiritually. Mm. Yeah. And so this is the proof text, Romans 7, 7, 8, and 9. And the point is, if there's no law, there's no sin. And they say, do you see that? If there's no law, there's no sin. And then Paul says, I once was alive apart from the law. There was a time in my life where I didn't have any sin. Now, the Bible doesn't say that. You add that in there. And it makes logical sense, right? And then you say, think about it. A baby comes out of the womb. What has it done? Mm. Nothing. Yeah. It's done nothing. So therefore, how, how is it a sinner? Right. So this would be their proof text. Now, well, it's not, it's not, so it's not just the proof text, but I think... This is the case too, and, and Mike Winger talked about this when we we analyzed uh, the uh, World Mission Society, World Church, Society of God. Church of God. Um, we've done a couple of different. I, I get that in one of the other episodes mixed up, but yeah. um, but it's an argument one by analogy, mm-hmm. right? And so you're not you're not just unraveling the text, but you're giving an analogy to try and argue from that. But you're also making an emotional appeal. Mm-hmm. Just look at that cute. Yeah. baby that's just a beautiful reflection now, of what yourself he done? like how, how has he done yeah so and again it's it's an it's an emotional appeal and then so yeah uh, so th- that's one example of a proof text that they would go to what are what are some other examples that they would, that, they would appeal to that's it i mean okay that that's the only proof text now when you get into psalm 51 where it says you know my mother conceived me and sin my mother conceived me mm-hmm. you know that would be argued well that was just david in such a repentant heart was just saying, surely I was just born this way. Yeah. Like, he didn't really mean that. He was just saying, man, I'm so repentant. I feel so bad that I've done this. Like, surely I was, I was just born in sin. You, mm. you see what I'm saying? So yeah. it's not a theological yeah. statement. So, and what, like, so at what point is there, is there an age of accountability? Or is there a certain point where, you know, you're raising children in a household and, you know, your, your beautiful daughter Marley, you know, mm-hmm. she is a very sweet girl and she loves Jesus, but there's times where, She's back. T- she's not listening to you, and she'll back talk you, and you have to be a dad and correct her. Yeah. Um. You know, a very gracious and loving way. But you know, there's a point where you, I think, as like, what's the process of someone in the Church of Christ when they see other people? You know, you're in, you're in co- you're in a community together, and eventually, you just see it. They're no different than any of us. Like kids, you know, they right. they grow up, they lie to their, you know, we lie. To, I've lied well, to my like, parents. I've I've gotten in fights with my siblings. Uh. You know, there's many things that I did right. that categorically put me in a, as a sinner. How do they process that? And, and what, does it look like, like, what does sin look like? From what, what point do they become a sinner? Well, so, you know, and, and, you know, Phil has a podcast, like millions of followers, and he did one not too long ago about this and talking about how, you know, you don't sin until you're about 15, 16, or 17. That's when you sin. And so here's the, pro- so here's the problem. This is why it's a heresy. It's not a heresy because the church didn't like this teaching, you know? 
it's a heresy because it gets you away from the gospel of Christ mm. because you can't see the gospel, you can't understand the gospel, you can't accept the gospel, the good news of Christ, if you believe this. And this mm-hmm. is why it's, it's worth fighting for, it's worth contending for, because if you truly love them, right, if you truly love these people, which I do, you know, then I have to be willing to fight for this. And I know that it, they might not like to hear it, yeah. but I have to tell them. I'm compelled to tell them. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Because if this is true, that they can't understand the gospel or see it, then, man, I've got to tell them if nobody else will. And so this yeah. is why I'm here. Like, I want people to, in the Church of Christ to see this and to start teaching this in the Church of Christ. Fine. Just teach mm-hmm. this. You know, Because what happens is you have this understanding. This is how it plays out. And then we'll talk about why you can't understand the gospel. Okay. okay. So how it plays out like this, Pelagianism, born perfect. Then you know why you're a sinner, Jerry, Jeremiah? Mm-hmm. And you do, you yeah. know, Andrew, do you know why you're a sinner? Is because, see, you're born perfect. The reason you are a sinner is because all these other people outside of you has influenced you to sin. And that, that might have took, you know, 12 years, 13, 14, 15, 16 years. But eventually, they finally wore you down and they caused you to sin. They influenced you. Because sin was outside of you. It wasn't in you. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so then here's how that affects relationships, okay? It affects relationships because when you have a problem with someone, it's never you. It's always them because they have influenced them. It's mm-hmm. never me. I never look in my heart, right? Does that make sense to you? Yeah. yeah. And so then you have another bad teaching that, that you can lose your salvation. Just, I mean, you can lose your salvation, right? And so if you can lose your salvation, this is how all this affects into uh, relationships. And if Psalm 115 is true, that you become what you worship, right? You become the God that you worship. Whatever, yep. wh- whatever idol you make up that's not yep. the one true God, you become like him. Well, if your God that you worship is one that says, if you keep messing up, this relationship's over, then all these people outside of you keep messing up. They don't do what you tell them to do. And then you get to the point where you say, you know what? This relationship is over. And you walk around with your chest out like you're the righteous one. You're the good one because you're doing what God would do and what God does. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So this is how it affects so many relationships, you know? Mm Mm-hmm. And um, but we can talk about why it's it's it, it, it gets you away from the gospel in, in a minute in a minute. But you have something you want to say? No, it's, it's just very interesting, and it's it's it almost seems like a very subjective standard because it's all talking about you know undue influence, how you are you are affected by an external circumstance. It's almost very Freudian in nature, where they talk about how you are just a creature placed in a neutral environment. It's always your external circumstances mm-hmm. that kind of mold and shape your, who you are. And there's, a, I think there, there's definitely a level in which that's true, but ultimately there's not a real accounting if you're going to talk for like the nature of you, why people do what they do outside of a, outside of a biblical worldview. But um, yeah, it just seems like to be a very, like a very vague and, and arbitrary uh, point at which you actually do become a sinner, which I think does play maybe a questionable role with their view on baptismal regeneration or when, when exactly do you get baptized mm-hmm. because your contingency for being baptized to have your sins aw- aw- washed away, it's almost that you're not doing it internally, saving you internally as someone who's born a sinner. Right. Like wretched man that I am, I'm here to wash away really the sins of someone else. You know, it's like, it's not me, my responsibility. I'm here to, it's like, I'm here to deal with deal with the consequences. Like we, I was with my brother. I don't know. This is not the best now. Here I am arguing from analogy, but um, let's just say I'm with my brother and he, we like to side together. He convinces me to go, let's go to the store and steal some candy. Mm -hmm. Um, And then we go out and we get caught. Right. And all of a sudden then I get in trouble. Right. And then my parents punish me and say, that's when I become a sinner. So I'm just, think, <clears throat> I'm just trying to process this. So eventually I come to the point where I'm a sinner and say I'm in the church of Christ and I want to get baptized. Is that because am I really washing away my own sin or am I really kind of washing away hmm. the, the influence stain and of influence, uh, the influence of my brother's sin? That's good. I'm, which I'm not, is yeah. makes you subject. Like, then what do you do? Like, I don't know. It's, it seems to be a, almost a, 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 com, a yeah. conflict of interest well, with here's, think about the this. whole salvation process. Think about this, Jeremiah. And this is what I've said is if if we're born perfect and you want people to go to heaven, right? That's what you want. And you you think that you have 
something to do with that. Like you're getting people to heaven right. by baptizing them. Okay. If, if, if that's what you want and that's what you believe that you're born perfect, then, then you should never be against abortion. Right. I mean, you're sending, you're pumping a million babies to heaven a day, right? I yeah. Mean, you're, you're pumping them out. So, but you, and, and wow. that sounds crazy yeah. and they don't like to hear that because they know logically it makes perfect sense, but it's yeah. like, that's ridiculous. No, it's not. If you believe you're born perfect and you want people to go to heaven. Yeah. That would be the best form of evangelism. I mean, you're, you're sending millions, right? Wow. That's, it's, that's heavy, man. But it's just one of those things you don't think about. And, and, and literally bless her. Heart, I, I, here's what I love is when I'm sharing with them and showing like when we get deeper into why you are born a sinner and you can't see the gospel without yeah. it. And seeing their, them go, oh my goodness, you know? And then when they see that they're truly saved by grace, and because, and I'll tell you, every person will say, and I don't care if you go to Church of Christ or what you go to, everybody who claims to be a Christian says, no, you're saved by grace. No, you're mm. saved by faith. They say they believe that, right? But the question is, do you really believe that? Right. You know? And when you go deeper into those things, and when people actually sit down and look at God's word and not scared to it, and and, and a lot of people refuse to. They refuse to study with anybody who, dis who disagrees with them right. or who will um, contend contend with them. Right. They, don't want, they want to talk to people who agree with them or who don't know anything. Wow. You know? so, so, so what I'm hearing too right now is like the very, the, the dangerous thing about the Church of Christ is that, number one, they speak Christianese just like the LDS speaks mm -hmm. Christianese. They may say grace and faith, but they have redefined terms. Right. But what's so dangerous about this movement is that they don't have another standard like uh, the Book of Mormon, right. for example, everything is coming from from this, and that's that's a scary thing. So I want to go back into that text in Romans seven, and and just for everyone too, Trey isn't is a pastor, mm -hmm. so can you can you dive into what Romans seven that you read earlier is is actually saying? What Paul is trying to communicate is he saying there's one time where he wasn't no. under the law? What's going on there? But well, here's what when he's saying this right here in Romans seven. He's not saying that there was a time in his life that he never sinned. I mean, if he says that, because if I ask somebody, does the Bible contradict, right? What do you think they say? It, it, anybody, if I ask anybody, do you think that a Christian... Right, I would say the Bible does not contradict itself. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Now, if Paul is saying that right here, that there was a time in his life where he'd never sinned, then he just contradicted himself in chapter 3 mm -hmm. and chapter 5. Right. Yeah. Right? completely contradicted himself. And so you have to show them this is not what he's talking about. Now, he might be talking, he's talking about, he might have not known there was a time where he didn't understand right. what coveting was, but when he understood coveting, he realized he's actually so covetous, right? So just because you don't know that you're a sinner yeah. does not mean you're not a sinner. Right. Right? So, and this is, it, it, what makes you a sinner is not your knowledge of it. No, you're a sinner because you sinned, right? This is what Romans 3 and 4 and 5 is leading up to. And so you have to explain that to them. You have to take them to the context and show them Romans. You know, it's really good to start with Romans 1 yeah. and go to 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, right? Mm -hmm. Don't just jump into Romans 7 because you'd be surprised that most people, and, mo and this is not, I mean, I don't want to even pick on the, on the church of Christ. I mean, pick on people in every church. We have to be creatures of the word. Right. We have to, we have to um, abide in his word if we want to truly be his disciples. That's what Jesus says in John 8. And so we need to know this book and not just know bits and pieces of it. Like, what is this whole thing telling me? And so we have to have the context. And I think a lot of people, not just the Church of Christ, but a lot of people, they know this verse or that verse, but they don't understand the context and what's going on. They don't know the whole book, right? And I, look, I'll be the first one to tell you, I don't know the whole Bible. I don't know every story, every person. Right. You know, no. But when it comes to soteriology, to salvation, to grace, I'm willing to sit down with anybody who agrees, disagrees, whatever. Maybe you can teach me. Maybe we can disagree. But all Scripture is God-breathed, used for teaching, rebuking, and correcting. Yep. So the man of God can be thoroughly equipped. So we need to, if we claim to be a Christian, if you, if anybody out here is listening, if you claim to be a Christian, and I claim to be a Christian, then you should be willing to sit down and let's talk about these things because these things matter. Because if I ask anyone, does it, does it matter what you believe? Everyone says yes. Well, then if it really matters, and if you really love me, can we please sit down and look at God's word? Because I, I, this is a big deal. Mm -hmm. You know, this is the history of the church says you cannot believe you're born perfect and go to heaven. And here's why. Let me show you why. You can't understand the gospel if you believe this. Yeah. Right. So, so, what, so what does the Bible say then about uh, people being born sinful? Can you give us some ex examples of original yeah. sin? So you would look at Romans, I mean, uh, Psalm 51, right? You want to look there? 
and and look, okay. Well, and this, this is probably one of those times too. I mean, you can want to talk about it, but I think too, I'm sure when you you've had conversations too with your friends in the Church of Christ when they want to do a Bible study in this regard. Right. So talk about the context of it, but let's also talk about what um, entails. Um, what they would respond, how they would respond to Psalm 51, and then what would be a response to their response? I'd love to unpack that. Yeah. Well, okay. I'm sorry. Totally confused there. What um, did you say? Uh, oh, yeah. Sorry. The, uh, yeah. So, uh, Psalm 51, uh-huh. uh, David's uh, confessional psalm, yep, right. that is used one to repudiate the idea that you're born sinless, but mm-hmm. I'm sure they probably have a certain way how they process, how they view that, yeah. uh, how they view Psalm 51. So, mm-hmm. How, what's the correct context, and also give an example of like how, what, what would be the, how would they view it, and then maybe we can also impact, like how would we respond to them? So, I, they would also okay. I, we said it a, a while ago. They would say that this is is not saying that he truly was born a sinner. He was just so repentant. He's just like surely I was just born this way, right? Mm. Well, mm. I would say well the context is that he is repentant. But he does mean this. Yeah. You know, it's not yeah. that because this goes along with everything else in the Bible. Right. Yeah. So yeah. therefore, yes, he's repentant of, of his sin. And he's like, God, you know, um, for I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me against you. And you only have I sinned and done what's evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and sin. Did my mother conceive me? Behold, you delight in truth and the inward being. So it's not that he's not repentant. Yes, he's repentant, but he's speaking truth. This is God's word, right? It yeah. goes along with everything else. Um, you just turn the page here in chapter 53. It says, God looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They have all fallen away. Together hmm. they have become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. So yeah. does that mean... Well, really what he's talking about, there's not one who's done good, not even one, means from 15 on up. Yeah. Or from 12 on up. And Paul reiterates this in Romans chapter 3 before he goes into the fall uh, and our generational curse from Adam, correct? Right. And so, yeah. And then then he goes into, you know, there's no one good. No, not one. There's no one righteous. No one understands. So does that mean no one above the age of 15? I mean, which, or is it, does it mean no one? Yeah. Yeah. No one. And so Hmm. check this out. Here's. Here's one good thing to think about, and this is, this is a good thing about the Bible. It's, it, the Bible will defend itself. Right. You know? Yeah. It's like a lion. Uh-huh. You don't have to, you know, you just let it loose, it'll defend itself, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. And so you think about, okay, let's think about Sodom, right? Sodom and Gomorrah. Yeah. Um, bad place, mm-hmm. right? This is a town of about probably, well, mm. I'd say 400,000 people. Mm-hmm. Let's, just, let's just say 100,000. Mm-hmm. I mean, the yeah. town I live in is about 100,000. And there's babies there. Right. I mean, good luck finding a place that has 100,000 people with no babies to 15-year-olds. Right. Yeah. They're going to have them, right? So if you go back to um, Genesis 18 and you read this, Sodom, God says, look, I'm about to destroy this place. And Abraham says, no, 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 mm-hmm. no, no. I, I tell you what, surely yeah. you wouldn't do it if there was 50 righteous. Because listen, if you're not a sinner, what would you be? Righteous, mm-hmm. Right. If you're sinless, you're righteous. Right. Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah. Is that why Jesus is righteous? Because he's sinless and he did everything perfectly? Right. Yeah, I would agree. Okay. So Abraham says, look, if there's 50 righteous people, would you not destroy it? And God's like, and, this, and what's crazy is a lot of people think that Abraham's changing God's mind right here. He's not changing his mind. Mm-hmm. It's not, but God's like, sure, 50, won't do it. He's like, how about 45? Yeah. 45? Okay. Mm-hmm. 40? 30, 20, 10, all the way down to 10. And Abraham's thinking, okay, odds are good we can find 10 righteous. So I'll just (laughs) stop there. (laughs) And God's like, dude, look, whatever. I mean, no, for 10, I won't do it. But guess what he does to Sodom? Mm -hmm. Destroys it. Why? Because there's no one righteous, no, not one. Mm -hmm. He will not kill the righteous with the wicked, he says. Right. And so are are we thinking that in a town of 400,000, and like I said, let's just dumb it down to a, a hundred thousand. Right. Do you really think that there's not a child there and a hundred thousand? Come on now. Right. See this. So it, it falls apart there. But we'll show you in Romans five where it really falls apart. Okay. You know? So do you want to see that? Yeah, I would love to see that. Yeah, and I just want to make a point too because this is a very theologically focused uh, episode, and and again, 
we have a lot of people who listen in from various different backgrounds, even worldviews outside of, of you know, being Christian. Um, and, you know, I, I want to make a point, too, that while we are a show focused in on cults and cultish groups, that some people are like, well, why are you just talking? All you're talking about Bible verses, you're just a cult talking about cults. Well, I just want to make a point, too, that really I, we want to argue and articulate that, and we did this in our episode, Is Christianity a Cult?, where we're talking about this is really the only framework where you can give an ultimate accounting why this, uh, like, why are people, why these, what a cult is. So when you talk about, uh, you know, one of the, the logo I have here in my shirt is one of our logos, Bad Theology Hurts People. So we're going to unravel, too, the sociological aspects of the Church of Christ, the struggles that people have, and, and even, like, the, the mental health toll they would have or trying to always put around a perfect perfect image and all the issues that, that come with that. But even any sort of the sociological or psychological manipulation always comes from a theological distortion. There we go. And the secularist worldview, when you have people like Sam Harris or other people who, uh, or, you know, Steve Hassan or... Uh, Rick, Rick Allen Ross or any of those cult experts that while they may be able to articulate different sociological and psychological n- manipulation or, or that sort of hurt, they can't give an ultimate accounting for it. And so what we're undoing, we're unraveling this theology because at the core, theology does matter because we're not just having a Bible study. We're looking at something. This was your life. This was something that you held near and dear. Yeah. And you've also seen people that I could see, man, you have a love for the, I spent the last you know, day and a half hanging out with you. We've talked on the phone a couple of times. Mm-hmm. You have a love for these people. You have a burden for these people. And, and we want to you know, show them that in this process, there is a reality where there's people who have a yoke that they can't bear, but then a real rea- a reality too, where it says where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So oh, mm-hmm. we, are, we are focusing in on this episode. This, is, we're not, this isn't just a Bible study. I mean, it is. But we're focusing in theologically because theology matters, mm-hmm. specifically with this and also any other cult that we're dealing with. So mm-hmm. um, I, I just want to make that point real quickly. But go ahead with uh, wh- where you were at in regards to um, yeah, we're going to look at about. look at Romans five. But I want to add to what you're saying. What it what it does when you when you believe and you're told that you're born perfect, right? Yeah. You're born perfect, and you grow up, and then you start sinning, and and you have this, and again. It's not on a conscious level. Like yeah. no one's thinking, I have no problems. It's always you, right? But when you're told you're born perfect, when you, that stuff is dripped in your head over and over again, it, it's what you believe, right? Right. And so what, you, what goes in your head goes down to your heart and it comes out your hands. This is why theology matters mm-hmm. with what you're saying. Mm-hmm. And so when you are being told this, and then one day when you're 15 or 16, then you finally sinned or you got a, you did a big sin and now you know you're really a sinner. Like let's say you got drunk, right? And now you, oh, now you get baptized, but you're getting baptized. Why are you getting baptized? Well, because you messed up and you want to go to heaven one day, right? And so you need to get that washed off of you. You don't realize how deep of a depraved sinner you really are, mm. right? And you'll never know how good God really is until you see how bad you really are, Right? And you never see that. You never see that. And that's what, it just kills you. You know, yeah. it, it's not a good thing. So let's look at Romans 5, how you are a sinner. Let, let's go back to chapter 3. Why did the law come, right? Can y'all tell me while I'm looking this up? Uh, look, why did the law come? To give us knowledge of, the sin, of, of sin. Right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. you know, you read Romans 1 and Paul's saying, look, the so Gentiles are really bad. It's our tutor. Right. Yeah. Biblically, it's, it's our tutor to bring us to uh, Christ. And you would see, For I always give the example when I'm on the street doing a family talk with our Mormon friends and neighbors that, you know, you wake up this morning, you know, I woke up this morning and I kind of looked at the damage that had been done for all the long traveling and kind of looked at the mess that I was in the mirror. And did I try and go to the mirror to uh, clean myself? No, that led me uh, to the shower. Right. <laughs> and so in the same way, that's, that is in very simplistic terms, that is the role of of the law is to point out our sin and then ultimately our yeah. needs for a savior. Yeah. And, and when we understand that it's Romans one, right? Romans one, Paul says, look, Gentiles, horrible people, bad. And then you get into chapter two, Hey Jews, you're actually worse because you had the law and you mm. still broke it. Mm-hmm. Right? So don't look down on them. Like you had the law. And then he gets into chapter three here and he says, for by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight. Since through the law comes knowledge of sin. Yeah. So what the law does is give you knowledge of sin, right? So that's right. why the law came. 
So if you think back to Romans 7, right? If there is no law, there is no sin, right? So let's look at Romans 7 again, just to kind of have a good understanding of what we're saying. So here's what they would say. Romans 7, uh, verse 8, For apart from the law, sin lies dead. Okay, so they're saying, so they would explain, if there is no law, there is no sin. If there is no law, there is no sin. Well, sin, the, the law came to give you knowledge of the sin, okay? Right. So we turn the page, we get to chapter 5, right? I'm going to start with verse 12. It says, therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, that would be Adam, right? That's right. Mm-hmm. And death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sin. Here we go. Ready? Verse 13. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given. So stop. Remember Romans 7, 7? If there is yeah. no law, there is no sin. And they explain. They explain it means, well, see, there, he didn't sin. No, no, no. He didn't have the understanding of it. He still right. sinned because he would be contradicting himself right here it says for sin indeed was in the world before the law was given but sin is not counted where there's no law mm-hmm. he's not saying that you you're not a sinner he's just saying you can't count it you can't check the box because remember chapter three the law was given so that you can have knowledge of it mm-hmm. so it's yeah. not counted you can't i can't be like you know what dang it i lied i slandered someone mm-hmm. i know i did because the law says it and i did it i can't count that because i didn't know the law right so let's read it again Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sin. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin's not counted where there's no law. Yet death reigned as a king reigned, not Mm -hmm. water, but reigned as a king from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one to come. Mm -hmm. So he says, look, these people died from Adam from Adam to Moses, all these people died. Even who, they didn't sin like Adam or Moses. Mm-hmm. Well, what, what did Adam and Moses have? They had the law. Adam said, don't eat this. That's the law. Moses had the Ten Commandments. But these people in between, right. they didn't have a law. Even the Gentiles. But guess yeah. what they did? They still sinned and right. death reigned. Why? Because the wages of sin is death. Mm-hmm. And so even though they didn't have the law, sin indeed was in the world. They just didn't know they were sinning, but they were sinning. And mm-hmm. so I explain this like when, like just because you don't have the knowledge of it doesn't mean you're guilt doesn't mean you're you're not guilty of it. And so I say like, what if someone who doesn't speak English can't read English comes to America, he rents a car, he's going down the interstate, and we live off I twenty, okay, Interstate twenty. And what if he's going 120 miles an hour down the interstate, and the cop pulls him over? Do you think he's going to get a ticket or not just because he didn't know? I-20 meant Interstate 20. He was going 120. Right. No, he's going to get a ticket. <laughs> yeah. It's regardless of what you understand or know, you broke the law, buddy. Yeah. You see, and that's yeah, what yeah. it's saying here in Romans 5. That makes sense, yeah. And so that would be it. And so the problem is with this is here's where you can't understand the gospel. Can I go into that? Yeah, go for it. Yeah. You want to say something? No, no, no. I'm listening, bro. You I'm listening? loving it. You're all in? I'm yeah, all in. All, we're all in. <laughs> okay. So you have the first Adam. Right here, it says that the, this Adam, he was a type of the one to come. He was a type of the one to come. So if there's a type of something, that means there's already something that exists, right? Like if I build something like a little uh, a building of, of blocks and I make it look like a building, it's a type of a building. Why, how can I make that? Because I know the real thing is out there and I've seen it. Right. And this mm-hmm. Adam in the garden is a type of who? The second Adam to come, Jesus Christ. Right. He already exists. He's already... He, he was already known, right? And so these two atoms are going to represent people. And so here's the, here's the logic behind being born perfect. It's this right here. People say, that's not fair that I'm held responsible for a sin I didn't do. I wasn't even there. How can I or this baby here be held responsible for something that happened that he didn't even do, Right. He didn't do it, therefore he's not responsible for it. He shouldn't be held responsible for it. And so the question is this right here, but see the second Adam over here? If you don't want to accept what you inherited from the first Adam, the imputation, it's it's the doctrine of imputation. If you don't want to accept the imputation of Adam, then what makes you think you can accept the imputation of Christ's righteousness? Because you Mm -hmm. didn't do that either. Wow. See how it becomes a works-based deal? Yeah, you weren't there then. Yeah, I I didn't do this. I shouldn't be held responsible. But you know what? You didn't do that either. Mm-hmm. But you think you are by your good works, by your baptism, by your, all your, your striving mm-hmm. and striving and striving. 
And you can't accept one atom if you don't accept both. You have to accept yeah. both representatives. Yeah, man. I got a question because I'm hmm. trying to put myself inside the mindset of someone in the Church of Christ. And you know, you're thinking about we're all made in the image of God. We all have this sort of haunting spectra of guilt of the sins that we do. And I think one of the most healing aspects of true confession and repentance is when you repent and you take you have to take full responsibility and ownership of your sin even though it completely sucks to do so sometimes and you know you think about we're talking about psalm 51 in regards to uh being born in sin but also what you see is a direct uh a direct uh point of reference for that repentance when david says against you and you only have i sinned i mean is there a burden it seems to me there would be a burden for people in the Church of Christ where they do have that level of guilt and sin and what what do I do for atone, to atone for my wrongdoings, right. but how, how can I ultimately take this to the Lord, take this to God, if it's ultimately not necessarily yeah. mine to begin with? It's an indirect sin, not yeah. necessarily mine to begin with. So how do you alleviate that burden of guilt? It seems that it would be a conflict of interest in many ways for many different people, especially yeah. people that you love and care for. Yeah. So I would say this, and I want to be very clear on this. Yeah. Because I have, like, again, many people I love and care for in the Church of Christ, um, they, they're Christians in the Church of Christ who truly have their faith in Christ, right? Now, they got some jacked up theology and understandings, and they don't have some good understandings, but Thank God that correct understanding doesn't save you. Only faith alone in Christ alone saves you. And yeah. so doctrine doesn't save you. Theology doesn't save you. Faith in Christ saves you. Okay? Now, there are people in the Church of Christ who, whose their faith really isn't in their works. I mean, there's a lot of them who are. And this is what makes them mad when you teach them the doctrines of grace. They get really upset because what you're doing is you're stripping away all their good works. You're stripping away all the good things they've done and all the things, all their bragging rights that they have before God one day. Now, they would never admit that, but that's what makes them angry about it, right? Mm -hmm, the doctrines mm -hmm. of grace. Yeah. But there are some who, who truly have their faith in God and they're, they're in Christ alone, but they have some messed up theology, messed up understandings. They don't quite get this. And so to answer your question, they have that, that tugging at their heart and they know that they're a sinner. They know and they, man, they plead and they're, they're hoping God will forgive them. They're, they're hoping and they're praying and they mm. want to believe it with everything they can, but they still struggle. And this is where, you know, you have the bad doctrine of losing your salvation, right? That you can lose your salvation. Well, then that starts playing on their mind. And so they live in this torment. Am I good enough? Have I done enough? You yeah. know? And this yeah. is why the doctrines of grace and the true gospel just releases people to see, oh my goodness, how good yeah. it really is. It's better than I ever dreamed it yeah. was, you know, because they truly are struggling through that. They are looking to Christ. It's just they don't have the confidence because they don't understand this word and the promises that he's made to them, you mm -hmm. know? And this is what I want for them. I just want them to see how good it really is, you that's, know? Yeah, that's heavy. You know, this makes me think of, uh, in this number one, it's like a lot of error, I think, happens in the church or breeds. And what, what, what happens eventually is people want to be Jesus. Like there's something wanting to be like Jesus is great, but wanting to be Jesus is something that's dangerous, right? Yeah. So I, what I mean by that is Jesus was born sinless. Mm -hmm. We weren't. Right. Right. But I think a lot of heretical teaching tries to ascribe to men what can only be ascribed to God. And, num and the second thing would be this, is that my salvation is not dependent on myself. Mm -hmm. Right. It's not dependent on me being baptized after I, I, I sin or something, something of that nature. It's actually dependent on, solely on the work of Christ alone. But how much of a burden must that be when your salvation is dependent upon your actions, right? To an oh, extent. It's, it's a miserable burden. And, and hey, look, watch this. I know a lot of people who've come out of the Church of Christ and, and see the doctrines of grace, and they're just like dying to tell their family. I mean, I have, we have a young couple who, great, unbelievable. I mean, I can tell you hours of stories yeah, of how this all yeah. started, but, but um, they came to my house one night, and, and I told them, I said, look, come at night. Don't come in the day. Don't tell anybody you're coming. If you want to come, I didn't even know the guy, okay? I was calling somebody else. He was in the truck with them. And we got to talk, and he started asking questions. And so then he wants to come over, and he wants to bring his family. I'm like, I didn't, I didn't even know. I knew he was married. I didn't know he had a kid. But they come over, and his wife is just, like, terrified, like, scared that she's coming over to my house. I'm like, right. why are you upset? And she's like, well, I just hear that you're, you're so divisive, you know? 
And I'm like, and I didn't ask them. They wanted to come over, right? I said, well, I am divisive. But your question should be over what? Like over truth. Right. You know, I will divide over truth, you know? And um, so we sat down. They asked questions. Um, I tried my best to answer their questions scripturally. And they went back and tried to ask elders, like, questions. They had questions, but they told them, no, we're not going to talk to you. We told you not to talk to this guy. And since you did and you didn't obey the elders, do not, we're done. Right. We're not talking to you. Right. And, and her family, and they, they hadn't even seen, like they, they've had another kid since this point. They hadn't even come to see them. Like just completely cut them off, cut them off. And, and, but, but again, again, Psalm 115, you become what you worship. Right. Yeah. And so if you think God is a God who will write you off and cut this relationship off, yeah. if you keep messing up, then that's what I do. And I walk around with my chest out proud. Yeah. And we've reached out to, to their leaders and said, listen, we need to help reconcile this family because God is a God of reconciliation and just no. And so all this stuff leads to such bad things. Yeah. It really does. You yeah, know? I can see that, especially if like you, the sin that the person commits in their life, if they're born sinless is done through the influence, influence of those brothers. who are sinners now because they're older. I could see how when you're in that situation, you want to cut yourself off of all ties from those mm-hmm. people because that's what causes the issue in the first place. Right. Is there like, is there a form of like disfellowship or excommunication inside the church of Christ? How does, how does that work? It's just, they just, they just shun. It's like a shunning okay. type. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I mean, so there's not like official. I mean, we've had actually ever stay up one day and say like, have nothing to do with, you know, my son, you know, like, because he, I don't know, did something stupid, you know? Right. Yeah. yeah and, you know, it, and so it's like, have nothing to do with him. It's like, man, mm. You know, there, uh, there should be church discipline. A church with no discipline is no church at all, right? But like, right. Th- there's ways to go about this. And right. So, mm. It's restoration, not yeah. like... Right. And so what we're looking at, too, when you talk about, you know, sort of not don't talk to them and whatnot. I mean, there, there's an aspect of that. But what we're talking about, one of the things that cults or cultist groups will do is that they will formulate their... Do- they're not taught to go chapter by chapter, verse by verse, really draw out the text of what the Bible originally meant. Uh, they'll take, they'll proof text. They'll take one little verse here, one little verse there to back up their own predisposition. So as a whole, is that how the Church of Christ views the Bible or how, how they kind of read through the, the Bible to formulate their doctrines that we're talking about? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a complete proof texting, um, atomizing proof texting throughout the scriptures. Uh, you know, like, so the gospel, right? So here's one in second Thessalonians chapter one, verse eight and nine, I could turn to it, but I'll just quote it to you. It says that, you know, how it starts off, how you, if you're going to share with somebody, you know, you obviously tell them, look, you know, you sinned eventually, you know, you're older, yeah. you're older than 16. So you're a sinner, right? Yeah. And you know, this is God and Jesus died, buried and rose again. Right. And so then you, you tell them that, you know, look, here's what it says in second Thessalonians chapter one, verse eight, nine, it says he will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from his presence. Mm-hmm. Okay. And so you, you tell them that and you look at them, you say, see, you're, you're going to go to hell. Who goes to hell? And you make them read it. And they say, well, uh, people who don't know God and who don't obey the gospel. And so you say, well, what's the gospel? So then you lead them through this trail but what I would say right there, like now, I say, yeah. stop, stop, stop. That doesn't mean what you think it means. So you think it means do something. Yeah. But that word literally in the Greek means, are you in agreement with the gospel? Yeah. Do you accept it? Are you in agreement with? And so what I tell people, I'm like, like, tell me what a ball is. Like, explain to me a ball, you know? And they'll say, well, it's round, it bounces, it has seams on it, you know, it, it can be oblong. And I'm like, yeah. no, absolutely not. That's horrible. That's not a ball. A ball is a place where you go in your, in your Sunday clothes and a tuxedo and a dress and you mm. eat caviar and you dance. <laughs> okay. See, I mean, it mat- like words matter. Like yeah. context matters. Yeah. And when you don't know the context of what that's saying to are you in agreement with, do you believe this, right, the gospel? It doesn't mean obey, like do something. But this is, the, this is where they take you, yeah. right? Yeah, that, that's good. That's good. So why don't we do this? So we've we talked a little bit the foundation of sinless perfectionism or, or Pelagianism, how this plays into really the burden that they have. So let's just jump into uh, their view of baptism. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's interesting too, because we're here at, at Philaf Feast and we've got, we've got Baptists here, we've got some Presbyterians here, and there's always the bantering back and forth, baptize your babies, blah, blah, blah. Bodhi here. Yep. <laughs> we always have the interesting uh, back and forth going on, but we're, you know, we have different people with different views of baptism. What, what differs with the Church of Christ is the exclusivity that 
happens. So it's not just baptism that's essential for your specific salvation. Um, you know, I, it's it's about specifically being baptized into the Church of Christ and into their version of it because they are, they're the ones that have the exclusive knowledge of it versus, mm -hmm. you know, when we're here with Baptists and Presbyterians, we're talking about the different aspects. We're, we're, we're talking about the same salvation, the same right. atonement of Christ. Right. We're brothers yeah. and sisters in Christ. So this is different. So maybe explain the point of the point of baptism from the Church of Christ view to, from your perspective of growing up in that. Right. And then let's talk just then about some of the proof texts they go to. Okay. And to add on to what you were saying, that we have Presbyterians, we have Baptists here. We might disagree on baptism, but we're still all Christian brothers, yeah. right? So I was at a, um, at a, a pastor's deal um, with Stephen Lawson, and somebody yeah. asked them a question about baptism or something, and he, he said, listen, we might disagree on baptism, um, but, you know, we're all brothers. And I'm sitting there, I'm like, hold up. And, I, and then it was during question and answer time, right? And I'm, I'm not the dude who gets up and asks questions. You know, I'm not that guy. But I'm just sitting there, I'm boiling because I'm thinking, because look, this is like baptism is a big deal for me, right? right. And this is like, I, 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 I cried tears over preaching to people and telling people they had to be baptized to be saved and trying to convince them and looking at them and saying, let me tell you, you know, yeah. what are you going to do? And you just stare at them and you, you emotionally get in their mind where you try to get them in the water. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you, you manipulate them, you know, and I did that for years and I literally cried tears and called people and apologized for that, you know, and I, I got counseling from some pastors over that to say, look, even God was sovereign over that. Just like he was sovereign over Paul and what Paul did to the, to the believers. Right. You know, you got to get over it. So, but at this conference with Stephen mm -hmm. Lawson, when he said, look, you know, we might disagree on baptism, but we're all brothers. I sat there for a little bit and everybody was done. He's about to shut it down. And I'm like, hold up, hold up. And I raised my hand. I walked up to the microphone. I said, look, Brother Lawson, I said, I, I just want to ask you, look, I know everybody's ready to go to lunch, but I have to clear this up. When you say that we're all good here, even though we disagree on baptism, you are talking about infant baptism and believer baptism, right? He goes, yeah. And he looked at me like I was crazy. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I come from the Church of Christ, and I just want to make sure that no one here believe that you were talking about baptismal regeneration, like you're saved. When He goes, oh, no, 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 no. He said, they're, they're, they're not our brothers, you know, mm. and which hurt me. I mean, yeah. it's Stephen Lawson, yeah. right? This is like, and so then me and him got to talk and, yeah. and it's just, you know, I just told him, I said, look, you know, my heart and look, it's my Nineveh. It really is like, I, I don't like it. I know it makes them mad when I talk to them, but I have to, I, I, cause I've been there. So like Paul loved going to the synagogues when he went to new towns, right? Right. Because he knew what they believed and why they believed it. Right. He knew what they were taught and why they were taught it. Mm. And he would go in there and say, guys, listen, this isn't right. Look at the true gospel, right? Listen to the gospel. And they would kick him out and say, you're an idiot. You're just trying to cause trouble. And so he would go out to the Gentiles. And I mean, I feel like that's me. Like, I don't want to do it. I don't like making people upset. I know they're going to get upset. Right. But you know what? People got upset with Jesus, too, for, yeah. for, for preaching the truth. Amen. So on your on baptism, where would they go to proof text? I mean, I would say, obviously, the, the first big one. I'll give you a chance. I'll give you all a guess. What, what do you think the first big one would be? John 3, 5. John 3, 5. That, I thought you were going to say Acts 2, 2 38. 38. Yeah. So let's go to John I 3, had a 5. Friend, I, well, I had a friend who was Church of Christ growing up. It was interesting. It's a funny story. So a lot of you know that uh, the high school I went to and how I kind of got involved in this, what I do here with Coltish was back in the late 90s when I was in a little high school uh, kid. And uh, all my well, majority of my classmates were Mormon. And I had a friend named Andre who was uh, Church of Christ, and I was like, oh, this is I got someone on my team, you know, he's, <laughs> he's not Mormon. And so I think he's a Christian, so the, they were bringing up their proof text, and they, the Mormons brought up John 3, 5, I'm like, no, that baptism doesn't save you, and, I, and he's like, yes, it does, no, it doesn't. I kind of looked up my friend Andre, he's like, yeah, it does, like, wait a second, I thought you were on my team, you know? <laughs> Threw me out, like, well, what's going on here? Bro! So, yeah. So, my back. I know, but, it, it, so there is a point, so the context of John 3, 5, uh, if you go there, it is the context of Jesus, and he is talking to Nicodemus. Yep. And by the way, one of the things I always love is that, G is that Jesus was always someone who just cut to the chase. Yep. Oh, yeah. Get rid of the small talk. Let's 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 get down to, to let's get down to business. Yeah. And he says, unless you're born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. And then you know you can analyze it, but what ends up what they do is that they'll take. What Jesus says is that unless you are born of spirit and of water, water and the spirit, you water cannot spirit. enter the kingdom of heaven. So that. And, and Church of Christ is not the only one to do this. They'll take the word water and equate that, oh, it means water, therefore yeah. that means baptism. baptism. So let, let's jump into that. So 
Um, let me just mark this. This is where I'm going to go with it. Um, so yeah, so you know, some people will say to a Church of Christ person, you know, when I used to be Church of Christ, and they still do it today, like, well, what about the thief on the cross? You know? Yeah. And so people say, you know, if depends on what level of Church of Christ person you're talking to. Um, someone might say, well, you know, he doesn't have to be because he's right beside Jesus, you know? Well, that's really not a good answer. Right? <laughs> not at all, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, but they're, you know they, they'll just stop there. But if you're really talking to a really good studied Church of Christ, or he would, he would say, well, why would the thief on the cross need to be baptized, right? Why would Jesus need to tell him to be baptized into the death of himself when he's not dead yet, or be buried into Christ when Christ isn't buried yet? Or why would he tell the thief mm-hmm. on the cross to be raised in baptism when Christ hasn't raised yet. It's pointless because you see Hebrews 9 says the will of a man isn't in force until the one who made it has been proven dead. Right? Yeah. And so if his will is for us to be baptized, he wouldn't have, there's no point of him telling the thief on the cross about baptism. And then that person's really confused and goes like, man, that's a good answer. Right? But yeah. if that person who asked the church of Christ or that just thought for a second and if he just explained to me that the thief on the cross, it would be pointless for him to talk about water baptism because he's not dead yet. Hmm. Then why is he telling Nicodemus when he walks out the front door of his ministry, tell him about being baptized? Right. Huh? Yeah, so yeah. you ain't thought about that. Like, why, like, so you're telling me that Jesus didn't tell the guy on the thief on the cross about water baptism because he's not dead yet. Yeah. Then why is he telling Nicodemus yeah. he ain't dead yet there either? Right. So, because that ain't what, that's not, that's what I'm ain't. my about. wife, when I'm preaching, my wife gets on to me all the time for saying ain't. <laughs> like, she's like, you sound like the biggest redneck. Like, stop it. Yeah. So, sorry. Uh, so, this is not what Nicodemus is talking about. I mean, what Jesus is talking about with Nicodemus either. He's not talking about being baptized, you know? He's talking about what Nicodemus should know when he says, look, look Nicodemus, you have to be born again before you can even see the kingdom of God. You can't even see it unless you're first born again. And so Nicodemus is like, what does that even mean? Be born from above, right? That's the actual meaning. So what does it mean to be born from above? And Jesus says, look, you got to be born of water and spirit. Now there's, you know, I love what John MacArthur says. He says, there's only one doctrine of different things, right? That you have all these different doctrines. There's only one doctrine. There might be different levels of understanding. There might be a milk understanding, Mm. but there's also a meat understanding, but there's Mm, only one, there's only one, doctrine here right and so i would say like a milk a milk understanding of being born of water and spirit uh it's 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 flesh gives birth to flesh spirit gives birth to spirit you could say well that's the waters you becoming a human being you know and then there's the spirit so it's it's for humans but here's what the deep understanding is and i think the clue that if we read the text slowly when you get down here to um verse nine okay so after he tells him that, that the spirit, the being born of the spirit is like the wind blows. You don't know where it comes from. You right. don't know where it goes. It just, boom. And when it comes, there it is. And that's being born again, right? Yeah. And so he says, Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? And Jesus answered him, are you the teacher of Israel? And yet you do not understand these things. He said, like, Nicodemus, you've got to be born of water and spirit. Mm. Like you have to be born of water and spirit before you can even see the kingdom. And Nicodemus is like, what does this mean? How, what are you talking about, the wind and the spirit moving like that? What is it that the teacher of Israel should know? The Old Testament, right? Yeah. yeah. The teacher of Israel should know the Old Testament. And so this is it right here. This is in Ezekiel 36. Because he, he, Nicodemus says, well, how can these things be? He says, Nicodemus, do you, you're the teacher of Israel. How do you not know this? Here's what he should have known. God says this in Ezekiel 36, verse 25 through I, God, will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanliness, and from all your idols I will cleanse you, and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you. (laughs) Look at this verse. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. This is what God does. Salvation is a work of God. He does it, Nicodemus. Mm. And that's why you really came here. You didn't come here to ask me that, and to tell me that, oh, we know you're a teacher. No, no. You want to know, have you done enough? No, you hadn't, and there's nothing you can do. You know, you know what? That's, this is beautiful because even in J- John 3, when you even go a little bit further, Jesus, if, if it had anything to do with baptism, 
You think when Jesus is explaining what Moses did by lifting up the serpent in the wilderness, mm -hmm. so all could look upon the cross with the serpent mm -hmm. uh, to be healed, when he's referring that he says, so shall the son of man be lifted up on right. a cross, he would then say, you must believe yeah. and be baptized. But wait a second. Mm -hmm. See, so you're, you're, you're now, Andrew, you're getting into another doctrine of okay. the church of Christ, which the church of Christ doesn't really have doctrines like written down that you study. We don't, there's no confessions and, you know, none of that. Yeah. But this is the, the teachings, right? And the teaching is the Old Testament doesn't apply to you. Now, that's a big deal. You just got rid of 90% of God's revelation to you, okay? Show them what the Bible so, looks like when you take out yeah. the Old Testament and so, the Gospels. Here's uh, what you're doing here is you're saying this right here. Well, let me get right. It's New Testament. It, well, real quick, while, while you're pulling that up, you're I just, go ahead. Go ahead. Just while, while you're pulling that up, uh, I just want to jump in too. And by the way, it, we are live right now. So if you are watching us on, we're just streaming here on Facebook. So if you have any questions too, and maybe we'll do a, a Q&A interaction uh, tomorrow. But, you know, just definitely give, give any commentary or thoughts that you have on this episode as we're streaming it live here. And we've actually got some. And so while we're talking about baptism, we're talking about the context of Bad theology hurts people, and uh, one of these, uh, Karen uh, Richter Hill, left this message, uh, left this comment here, and said, uh, "I said I had a Church of Christ friend tell me that if you found someone dying in the street, you cannot give them the gospel mm -hmm. to go to heaven. Right. You have to take them to the Church of Christ and have them baptized to go to heaven." Right. So again, that that shows one mm -hmm. a, a lack of disregard for those who are you know in that position right. on the street, but then the, there's this unweighted burden that oh no. I want this person to hear the gospel, but I can't do anything because yeah, I don't have the ability to take him up, to pull him off the streets right. uh, and do that. Right. So, mm. Sad. Yeah. And so back to what you're saying is uh, in John 3, you're quoting verse 15, right? That when he's lifted up and whoever believes in him, uh, he doesn't say be baptized. But their explanation is that, well, the Old Testament doesn't apply to you, right? So this right here of revelation of God, this much doesn't apply, only this much, right? Well, that's ridiculous. Right. And so here's something, but you, you, you might be thinking, Andrew, you're like, Trey, but John is New Testament. Yes. But no. See, what you don't understand is the New Testament doesn't actually start until Acts. Mm. So Matthew, Mark, Luke and John are actually Old Testament books because that's when Jesus came to fulfill the. This is alive. Where, right. It's a and, gospel, you know, and when yeah. I, you know, I'm talking to some people, I mean, I talked to an elder who I love to death. Um, not too long ago, I said, look, do you think you could be a Christian and say that the words of Christ don't apply to me? Yeah. Like, can you be a Christian and say that? And he's like, no, no, no you can't. I'm like, okay, do you believe John 3, 16? He's like, well, yeah. I'm like, okay, let, let's read it slowly. For God so loved the world that, what does he say? Mm, he gave he his gives only begotten son, son that whoever believe on him. That whoever, so yep. I, do you believe that? Do you really believe that whoever believes in Christ will have eternal life? He looked at me, he's like, Huh. So you don't believe that. Mm. You don't believe the words of Christ. Like that's, that should be a, what? Like what kind of word judo Bible junk has been happening to me where I don't believe the words of Christ apply to me. Mm. Right? Right. Cause that's in John, not necessarily. Yeah, Cause that's old test. Right. You know? Okay. And so, but you know, it's, it's so sad. Yeah. It's just, it's heartbreaking and it really, it's, it's just heartbreaking. That's all I can tell you, man. I, it, yeah. it kills me. Yeah, and just I'll give another example. One of my thoughts when it comes to de dealing with it, just context-wise, and, you know, and especially when you're taught to read a passage out of isolation, you know, you look at John 3 and John 4, just in comparison to each other, and you get, use the example of them in the covenant, is that, you, like, John's using the gospel to show that it's for everyone. You give the example of being Nicodemus, this Pharisee of Pharisees, who was supposed to be very knowledgeable of the Old Testament, and Christ meets him where he is at. And Nicodemus, another thing too, is that Nicodemus is meeting with him at night. Mm -hmm. um, so, and that's because he didn't want to be seen uh, right. talking to Jesus. So there's the fear of man aspect there. And later on, you see Nicodemus, he makes a cameo uh, later on in the Gospels. And uh, those of you who know it, you know it, and if not, read it. <laughs> but what's interesting too, is that the very next chapter, you have John chapter 4 talking about how the, you know, John 3 is saying that the gospel's for the Jews and that John 4, the gospel's for the Gentiles. So you look at the woman at the well. So back during the historical times, the Samaritans were almost viewed as non-human, that right. they were just deal, they were dealt with yeah, half-breeds, the lesser of the less people. So it's not just a Samaritan. Jesus talks to a Samaritan prostitute. 
and basically calls her out on her sin and meets her, meets her where she's at. It's, just, it's a beautiful passage, but what, where I'm talking about in regards to baptism is that Jesus, Jesus is talking about a metaphor here in John 3, and church, the Church of Christ would agree with that, right? That he's talking about water, but he's actually talking about baptism. Uh, That's yeah, they the argument. say it's baptism. Okay, so, I'm, and I've talked about this with someone who's UPC, and he could not answer me for the life of me. Well, here's a situation, and I would say, I, and here's what I would talk to you as a Church of Christ person, because okay. you have the same view. I would say, well, John, John 4, Jesus is talking to the woman at the well. There's physical water involved, and she asks, how can I have this living water? Mm -hmm. Why is it when she asked that question, not once did Jesus ever mention anything mm -hmm. remotely regarding to baptism? The only thing that came up in the conversation was he called her out on her sin, mm -hmm. and then they had a conversation about the temple, right. and he pointed it to himself. Right. And so that's something where I would just, I would have, and Multimar would do this, where you'd have someone, a cultist, read that text in, in context and ask the question. Yeah. So if I ask that question to someone at the Church of Christ, yeah. like what, what, what would be your process as someone in the Church of Christ like if see, I brought that up to you? So I'm, I'm now, I got the Church of Christ hat on. Yes. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I'm looking at you and I'm like, dude, you think you got me on something? I'm about to wear you out. Uh-oh. Right? Yeah. I'd be like, Jeremiah, dude, you don't understand something. Listen to me. Why is someone baptized? What do they get baptized in? What does Romans 6 say? Mm. You're baptized into the death. It says, look, shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We died to sin. How yeah. can we live any longer? Don't you know that all of us who were baptized were baptized into the death of Christ, right? Into his burial, into his resurrection, right? In order that we might be saved. So, so, in, other so, words, you, so in other words, you wouldn't answer the text. You, you would divert no, to another No, no, I wouldn't even divert. Yeah. I'm just, I'm explaining to you okay. why this woman wouldn't get baptized. Why would she be baptized into the death of Jesus when he's not dead yet? Oh, okay. If baptism is being baptized into the death of Christ, into the burial of Christ, and the resurrection of Christ, why would this woman? But wouldn't that also be contradicting John 3? Because he's mentioning water baptism before his death, saying this is how you must be born again. And that's, it seems, it's now that's you're in the something. present tense. Right. But, you know, mm. yeah. See, like, th that's what they, they would, ah. That's what my oh, point is. Why, yeah. do they, why are you telling me that Jesus doesn't mention baptism to the thief on the cross at the end of his right. life? But he does on the beginning, when mm. he's not dead here either in chapter 3. Yeah. Because that's not what it's about. I mean, yeah. and again, here's, here's what I would say. It's not so much when you talk to someone in the Church of Christ getting into a deep Baptist, baptism debate with them. Yeah. You know, you got to hit, dude, you were a wretched sinner. You, have, you were born yeah. in sin, and, and you know it. You know what I'm saying? Like, and you get them to see, like, kids are bad. Yeah. You know, you... You're a horrible person. God is a holy God, eternal God, and your righteous deeds. So mm. think about it. Is baptism a righteous deed or not? Is baptism a righteous deed? Yeah. Yeah, it's a righteous deed, but guess what it is? It's a filthy rag to God. Yeah. There is nothing, and when you say, they would agree with you, there's nothing you can do for your salvation, but you ask them, do you really believe that? Do you believe that there's nothing you can do? Mm. So that means even your baptism. No, there's nothing. It's faith alone in Christ alone. And then you can show them all through Acts that it's not baptism in Acts. And, you, and you know, mm -hmm. I like to stay in Acts because in fundamentalist groups, which the Church of Christ is a fundamentalist group, they like to stay in Acts yeah. because there's a lot of baptism. Like Pentecostals love to stay in Acts because they're like a lot of tongue stuff, you know? Yeah. And so that's where they want to stay and camp out there. And so I was like, look, let's just stay in Acts. Let's stay in Acts. We ain't got to go, like, because if we go anywhere else, you're going to drown in Scripture, right? So mm -hmm. let's just stay in Acts, see what it says. But you've got to understand where they're coming from. They're coming from, like, you look at chapter 4 from an orthodox Christian view. You have to look at it from an unorthodox Yeah. that that's not even New Testament. Mm -hmm. So, so you, you think that's, New that's not even New Testament. Yeah. That's, that's why it doesn't apply. So let's get, let's get to Acts 2.38 then, yeah. uh, specifically. Since that is New Testament, right? And it's so going to New Testament. Uh, apply to us. Can you read it and then kind of give the, the idea behind it? Because i got a question uh, with regards in t to Acts 2.38. Maybe I'm thinking incorrectly, uh, but I would love to hear you just uh, go through it real quick. Acts 2.38. Peter said, I can quote it to you, but Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For this promise is for you and for your children, for all who are far off. Everyone whom the Lord God calls to himself. And I want to say this real quick. 
is we started off by saying I was mentored and discipled by Phil Robertson. Yeah. You know, when I came, became Reformed and studying historical Christianity and, and, and seeing this stuff, and then, you know, before I even went to seminary or any of that, um, you know, I got, you know, none of my leaders would talk to me about this and, like, study with me, you know, because I'd be like... I don't have a dog in this fight. I'm just like, look, what does this mean? Right? Right. What does this mean? What does this mean? What does this mean? What does this mean? And they're just like, no, 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 no. It doesn't mean that. Whatever it means, it doesn't mean that. You know? And so I was just not satisfied with the answer of it doesn't mean that. But I want to say that, like, of all of my leaders where I came from, the only one who literally sat down and studied with me was Phil. And that's what I really love and appreciate and respect yeah. about him. And, and this verse reminds me when we were studying, you know, one of the other guys who was there asked me, what does Acts 2.38 say? And I said, well, it says, repent and be baptized every one of you for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. What does verse 39 say? And he's like, ah, you know? I'm like, well, let's read it. And so Phil reads it and he says, it's, he gets his Bible out and he reads it. It's, it's, this promise is for you, your children, all who are far off, all whom the Lord God calls to himself. And then when he read that part, it's for all whom the Lord God calls. He's like, all right, I'm listening now. And so we had mm. a really good Bible study. I appreciate the time that he gave me to, to listen. You know, he's the only one. And so, I mean, I just want to say that that meant a lot to me. Yeah. Well, even even too, when you look and we, we gave an example, too, we're kind of we're going into, uh, you know, kind of like playing devil's advocate, going back and forth, talking, mm-hmm. putting the Church of Christ hat on yeah. and, um, you know, talking about that. So we, we use the example between John three and John four. And, and, I, and obviously that was an example to show that it's important as Christians to read the entirety of the Bible in context. And the mm-hmm. more you become familiar with the original, you'll be able to give answers to people, not just to say, ha, huh, I'm right, you're wrong, but to ask constructive questions to get them to think because the one of them, I think the, the real sweet spot is as two things is one you want when you can get them in a place where you can just say something that's outside the realm of what their proof texts are and all of a sudden you get them to think that that's really where the where the, where the real juice is in regards to uh, evangelism to uh, to occultists and getting them to think that's but it. also I think that um, you know presuppositionally we don't have to necessarily convince them that they are sinners under the burden of sin. They know that they are according mm-hmm. to what scripture already says about right. them. So there's that. But jumping into Acts 2.38, and you're familiar with this passage too, I believe it's in Acts chapter 10, mm-hmm. where it this is a counterpoint where it said, where there's uh, the gospel is being preached. And just for the sake of, to paraphrase it, there's a, there's a, a group that experiences conversion. And it says, shall we not bring these people to the baptism of water to, to be baptized mm-hmm. as they have received the Holy Spirit mm-hmm. just as we have. So in that context, what you see is that these people have already received the Holy Spirit prior to the waters of baptism. Mm-hmm. So if, if we're going to, you know, put on your Church of Christ hat on that one, well, it's saying, well, hold on a second. Well, you're saying you're giving this as a this is the method. A method is being taught for baptism in Acts 238. Mm-hmm. But we're seeing here these people are being told have already received the Holy Spirit and they haven't been baptized. How, how do you account for the two? Yeah. Um, so here's what the, a good Church of Christ would say. But I, before I even put my Church of Christ hat on, this is in uh, Acts 10. And if you look at verse 43, it says, To him all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives the forgiveness of sins through his name. And I had uh, uh, one of my old friends tell me that that's just shorthand for baptism. I'm like, man, wait. it literally says that whoever believes in him receives the forgiveness of sins. And just, you can just say that's shorthand for what you believe it. Like mm-hmm. it, that's crazy. You know, but it, it, that's what, that's what happens. So what I would say is a church, if I'm putting my church of Christ hat on right yeah. here with, with chapter 10, and you mentioned the, the key verse that should be read as a church of Christ person but here would be the explanation if you were a Church of Christ person explaining this. I'll read the text and then explain it to you in a Church of Christ way. While Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. And the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. For they were hearing them speaking in tongues and exhorting God. And Peter declared, can, can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit? They stopped there. I would stop there as a Church of Christ, right? 
And I wouldn't do it on a conscious level. It's just the way I was trained. Mm -hmm. So I would just stop there. Yeah. Right? Because my focus is what? Baptism. That's my focus. And so I would say, okay, here's what you need to understand. These are the first Gentiles converted, correct? Yeah. Okay. Correct? These are the first Gentiles converted? Okay. So let me ask you a question. It says the Holy Spirit fell on them. Okay. So, Andrew, what's better for a baby, milk on them or in them? In them. In them. Mm. What would you say? <laughs> would, would milk be better poured on a baby or in a baby? Um, would I would say? be very concerned to see. I mean, we're here at Fight Left Feast, and there's a lot of people. Uh, just pouring milk on that, their babies? Yeah, there's, there's a lot of people, a lot of kids. <laughs> lot of some kids people here. carry around babies. And just pouring, uh, I, have, I have not seen anyone pour milk on their baby yet. Right. So you would uh, say it's better to I be would in be, them. I'll be concerned. I'm like, is everything okay? Right. You need, so as you, you can see here, yeah. Jeremiah, <laughs> yeah. the spirit is not in them. It's on them. It oh. just fell on them to show Peter and the other apostles that they can be baptized and actually receive the Holy Spirit. Mm. And now look, now you're someone that doesn't know the Bible, right? Oh. You are, you don't know anything about the Bible. And so you're like hearing this, you're like, oh my gosh, that makes sense. Milk in a baby, on a baby. Yeah. Holy Spirit was on them, not in them. It was just to show them that the Gentiles could be saved. Oh, yeah, I get it. And you flip to something else, right? But yeah. let's just pause. Read that verse again, verse 47 of chapter 10. Can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? Mm -hmm. So, see, they talked to me, and I would have to say, well, listen, are you saying that the apostles and Peter did not have the Spirit in them? It was just on them? Because they received the Holy Spirit the just as way. they did. Yeah. And so then... I want to turn real quick to 15, chapter 15. He retells this story. Luke records it again. He says, look, after there had been much debate. Pause right there. After there had been much debate. So that's not wrong, right? Mm -hmm. Somebody's got to stand up for the truth, contend for the faith. Mm -hmm. yeah. Peter stood up and said to them, brothers, you know that in the early days, God made a choice among you that by my mouth, the Gentiles should hear the word of, God, of, of the gospel and believe, not be baptized, but and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. Mm. Mm. So he retells the story and again says they received the Holy Spirit just like we did when we had faith. And this mm. would go back to, you know, like, uh, when you're talking about baptism with the Church of Christ, they love Romans 6. Why? Because it's about, it talks about baptism. But if you just stop and go to, remember I, I told you earlier, it's, it's really important to go Romans 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. <laughs> right. Because there's something that comes before all that, yeah, right? Yeah, very important. And so Romans 5 says that we're justified by faith. And since we've been justified by faith, we're at peace with God. So that's chapter 5, verse 1. So if we just stop and say, listen, do you really believe the word of God? Because this is what makes a disciple. This is what is what salvation is, the faith of Abraham, right? Yeah. Abraham believed the word of God. When God spoke, he believed the yep. word, yep. period. Amen. Yeah. That's what made him righteous. That's what, in, in the eyes of God, he was viewed righteous because he believed the word. And here, the word says you're justified by faith. And now, because of that, you have peace with God. Do you believe that? You don't. You don't believe the word. You believe it's faith plus baptism. And this is called Roman Catholicism. Faith plus baptism unto good works equals salvation. That's, that's Roman Catholic. Church of Christ is faith plus mm. blap, baptism unto good works. Because you don't know. You might lose your salvation, right? Right. I, then you have salvation. I have a question. So if we go to like uh, thinking about Acts 2.38 and what the text says, for the remission of sins, right? right? Repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. What do they believe actually occurs in baptism? Do they, do they believe, looking at the text in that way, that literally their sins are removed from yes. them in the baptism? Yeah, it's, it's you receive. So take Galatians out of the Bible, okay? Because mm -hmm. it's very clear that you receive the Holy Spirit by hearing with faith. Right, right. I mean, as clear as a bell. Romans is clear as it. Galatians is clear. Um, the Old Testament's clear, but that doesn't apply to us. So, yeah, they would say that when you're baptized is when you receive the forgiveness of sins. That's forgiveness of sins. Because like, your sins are not forgiven until you're baptized into Christ, into the death of Christ. Because when, you, when you're baptized, that's when you die to yourself. That's when you're dead and you're buried and you raise up new. I mean, it's the same lingo. You see what I'm saying? It's, 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 it's a very good thing for people who don't understand the book 
I mean, right. you can really twist some people up in this. And then, you know, I got friends who are just good old Baptists that are getting influenced by this stuff. Yeah. And it starts creeping in, you know what I'm saying? And then all of a sudden you start seeing them, they go to these retreats. And now, like, do you think any Baptist retreat would ever be baptizing people just like this? No. 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 But nowadays right. they're like, dunk them. You know what I'm saying? Like, whoa, whoa, whoa. It's, I mean, <laughs> it's, it's just not good. So yeah. you know, they, don't, uh, they don't even understand what they're getting into. Well, if anyone had any doubt that we are hanging around a bunch of Presbyterians, you can hear in the background, we have a bunch of uh, folks very passionately singing psalms uh, here at Fight Life Feast. So that's, uh, that was, if you were hearing that background, that's, what, that's what's going on there. Um, so yeah, it's very, um, yeah, it, it, I, I appreciate the point of you, you bringing that all out. And so when it comes to the aspects of uh, baptism too, where you, you're t- and I appreciate you giving that context, how, how do they view um, the cross, what Jesus actually accomplished, uh, what he accomplished on the cross? Because I know when I was spending time actually interacting uh, with some folks who were uh, UPC, uh, United Pentecostal Church International, UPCI, and we've done episodes on them, they would have the same view of, of uh, baptism and viewing those, uh, and just viewing those certain passages in that particular context as, as they see it. But when it comes to the, when I was talking about what happened at the cross mm-hmm. and what, what was Jesus doing, what, what actually happened there? There seemed to be a real struggle and disconnect because the focus was in so much on baptism. What did they? What's their view of the atonement, or how do they view what happened at um, the cross, or is there a disconnect there? Yeah, there's, there's obviously a disconnect. There, I don't think they understand atonement, right? But, uh, and I'll tell you this, like just to be fair, I mean, they, they, they would say the right things. Everybody says the right yeah. things. I mean, I don't ever talk to a professing Christian. I don't care what they are. I don't care what they are. They say, yeah, we're saved by grace alone, through faith alone. They say God's in control of everything. He's sovereign, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. They, they say that there's nothing you can do for your salvation. They yeah. say that Jesus, like, but it, but did they really believe those things? I mean, you have to say those things. And so really, they don't believe that there really was an atonement at the cross. I mean, they would say that. They would mm-hmm. say that Jesus died for our sins and everybody sins. But when you really get in the weeds of it, because they just don't, there's no depth, yeah. right? They can't. They really, at the end of the day, mm-hmm. in reality, Jesus died for an opportunity for everyone. Yeah, hey, let, let's he do didn't the, really pay for anything. Yeah, and let's do this. If anyone is um, on here, we've got uh, I think around thirty or forty people on here, and we'll just take them as they go. If you have a specific question for Trey, since we are live, uh, go ahead and ask that, and we'll take a look. I'll keep an eye on the comments here, so uh, feel free to kind of give leave your questions and interact. We'll do what we can interact with them. But maybe can you give now some practice, because now we gave the example a moment ago, bath theology hurts people. Um, talk about the, now this view of baptism, the sinless perfectionism, and kind of really not having an ultimate point of reference for the sin that they're dealing with, because it's sort of by a process of undue influence, not being born, that's not something that's solely yours and yours alone. Uh, there's that aspect. But now I have to be baptized, but you know, there's times where now then, I'm still and then, there, and then rebaptized, then rebaptized because the yeah, first talk one. Yeah, talk about talk about that. The first one didn't take, mm-hmm. right? I mean, I don't know, you know, and, and I'm sure everybody has their own different lingo. But ours back home was, if you know, if you if you got baptized and then you all all of a sudden started going off a different path, going crazy and doing stupid stuff, and you want to come back, I mean, then it's a man. You you really need to get rebaptized. You need to get you need to get rebaptized, and you know the first one didn't take. You know, mm-hmm. or if someone yeah. wanted to get rebaptized, they would be like. Hey man, I think I need to be rebaptized. And they're like, "Hey man, okay," because I mean, I'm not going to stay in the way of that, right? And mm-hmm. so, I mean, if you think about when they say, like, "Well, we don't believe that the water saves you," we don't believe that, yeah. you know, because yeah. you can't say that. But when you say they got rebaptized or they need to because the first one didn't take, what didn't take? See that that that's what I'm wondering. Like, so I'm thinking back at their now. Th- look, I, I used to say that now. Like right. that that was me. That was me. Like that was me. And yeah. I, I mean, many others, but. Yeah, that's what that's what I'm wondering. Like, so if we go back to the what we were talking about in the beginning with the full on Pelagianism that you're born sinless until you eventually sin at some arbitrary age. Um, so when you're baptized for the remission of sins, when I'm thinking about the text in Acts two thirty eight, it would logically follow that literally means baptism removes those sins from you. Mm-hmm. You're almost back at the same spot you were yeah, before you ever a, sinned. It's a do over. So. Yeah. 
wouldn't logically that mean every time you sin that you need to be baptized again? Well, no, I mean, well, look, so here's the deal. I mean, you have, if that's if you take Acts two thirty eight to its yeah. logical conclusion, yeah. But now you have like Mormons, right? Mormons yeah. say that there's just yeah. one Mormon church, right? But there, we know there's all these different sects. Of course, okay? yeah. Church of Christ, there's all these different sects as well. I mean, you have mm. one cuppers. You have people who say, okay, you have a church building, but you can't have the auditorium or like a a kitchen area in it because that would be sinful. If you have to have a walkway, like a breezeway to the other kitchen area, but there has to be a little gap because it can't meet the church building. Legalism gets very legalism. Yeah. So, I mean, there's totally different stages in the church of Christ. Like I came from a very, I mean, in the church of Christ world, a very liberal church of Christ, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like now they have music, right? In which, you know, that's a big no, no in the church of Christ to have musical instruments. Okay. I mean, so I came from a very, um, like a liberal, it would be considered um, Church of Christ. So, I mean, they would, they wouldn't, like, where I came from, nobody, and, and not many people I know. Now, maybe I, there's probably some, but most would not say that you have to get rebaptized every time you, ha- you sin, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, they, you know, they're starting to get a little gracious. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, I got, you know, um, a ton of people I love to death up in uh, North Arkansas where I, I mean, I love this church. It's a Church of Christ church. Love these people to absolute death, the sweetest people in the world. And I can't imagine one of them saying that you got to get rebaptized if you sin again. Like they, they do get a grasp of grace. I think that's kind of a newish thing mm-hmm. in the Church of Christ. You know, I think, you know, 20, 30 years ago, not so much. But uh, I think they have grown in that area. They're trying to get some of those concepts. They, they get it a little bit. So, but there are some who would say that, like, like if you see an 18 wheeler about to hit you and you say a cuss word, like, you're out, dog. Yeah. yeah, it's almost like trying to have your cake and eat it too, because it almost sounds like if you take Acts two thirty eight that the baptism removes the sins, then you would kind of have to keep getting baptized every time yeah. you sin. So it's like we we'll take a little bit of grace, but now we're going to be in contradiction to what we really hold yeah. to in, for, in the first place. Seems really inconsistent. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's let's do this real quickly. Um, we, and again, if you guys are listening in, we're, we a couple of you've asked some good questions. Um, and it can be really about anything that we've talked about so far. We've been on for about an hour and thirty minutes. So thank you guys for uh, watching us live here. Um, I think this is a really good question. Uh, Laura oh, yeah. uh, Renee asks that uh, she said, "So is baptism for nothing?" And I think that that is a good question because if you have, and I don't know if uh, Laura is Renee is Church of Christ, I would assume that that's a possibility given the question. But I think that's a legitimate yeah. question to answer. So what is so one. if we're going to argue that baptism is not essential for salvation, I would say that. The result of being saved is a changed heart with new desires to love the things of the Lord and desire the things that He desires. And so, one of the things that if you are if you, if you profess faith in Christ, but you have no desire to be baptized, I think that is something you could bring into question because it's an aspect of obedience. Um, and even though I would say, even if it's not, uh, if baptism doesn't save you. Um, it's not. It, it's, it's a faith in Christ alone, and it's Christ. It's Christ's work on the cross that that saves you. I, I, you could still argue that baptism is inherently a spiritual uh, practice and work in the same way where it says, you know, draw near to God, and He will draw near to you. On the very basic level, it is an act of obedience. Anytime you do an act of obedience, you choose to follow Christ, and you, know, you ch- for example, you're putting sin to death, and you say, I do not want to do this sin. I want to follow and be obedient to Christ. There's a level that is a spiritual practice in, in, in and of itself, and that's just my thought on it. But explain, for someone who asked that, and they're from the Church of Christ, how do you explain what baptism actually is in a way that they understand? This is good. So I want to tell you about um, a very um, false, a false humility, right? A false humility, piety a emergent t- church type philosophy answer to some of this stuff it would be a church of Christ who says, oh, I don't want to get in the debate. I mean, because even a Baptist says you still have to do it. If you truly are Christian, you're going to do it anyway. So I don't want to even get in the b- debate. Right. So I'm yeah. like, I'm backing out. I'm the pious one. I'm the pious one. Like, no, 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 no. Like, so the question, her question is, is baptism for nothing? Well, is feeding the hungry for nothing? Mm. Right. Is, is clothing the poor for nothing? Like, no, it's, it's what Christ said to do. And so let me, here's the question. And I, I, we believe we're, we're all doctrines of grace, reformed guys here, right? Yeah. Oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed and crucified. Let me ask you only this. And so this is why I tell people, let me, let me ask you only this. 
Did you receive the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Like, let me just ask you, did you receive the Holy Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? And they say, well, I'm not talking about works of the law. I don't think I get it by works of the law. I'm like, I don't think you understand what the law is. If God says to do anything, if he says skip across the road three times and then do a belly roll, that's Mm -hmm. law. You better do it. You better do whatever God says to do, right? But by doing those things, if you think you receive the Spirit by doing that, like, no, 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 no. You missed the point. Or did you receive it by hearing with faith? He says, are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you receive, did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Again, hearing with faith. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Know that it's those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, by faith, preaching the gospel beforehand to Abraham. See, the Old Testament does matter. Yep. The gospel was preached to Abraham, yeah. and that's Old Testament, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. And then you go on to verse 14. It says that we receive the promised Holy Spirit through faith. And so this is a big deal. This is the Galatian heresy. This is why chapter 1 says you will go to hell if you believe any other gospel, right? Right. Because his gospel is that you're saved by faith alone in Christ alone. That's chapter 2. Chapter 3, he says, listen, if you don't, you, you need to understand this, guys. And this mm-hmm. is a big deal. And this is where my heart is because I love these people. And if this book right here is true, Galatian, if the Galatian heresy is true, and if he was mad because they were taking the old law out of context, how mad would Paul be if they're taking his own words out of context? Wow. Yeah. yeah. You know? That's good. And so another question is, uh, and the, I think you are articulated this uh, a little bit earlier. Um, let me see if I can find it here uh, real quickly. But and maybe you can just re-articulate. I think you mentioned this earlier. But also, Laura uh, mentions that uh, says, "I've heard you. I've heard it said to believe in Christ, you are saved. But there was never a disciple who was not baptized. What's the separation and importance slash significance of baptism apart from?" apart or attached to salvation. Uh, just address that real quickly. Okay, well, I don't know how to make the claim that there was, what did she say again? Can you go back just to um, double? It says, yeah, it says, no I, one who I've heard is that a it, disciple, was ba- like, they were all baptized? Yeah, it says, I, I've heard it said to believe in Christ, you are saved, but there is never a disciple who was not baptized. Okay. Um, I'm assuming that's a Church of Christ claim. Uh, what's the separation and important significance of baptism apart of, uh, was there significance importance or, of baptism apart or attached to salvation? Yeah. So look, look at the first part of it, that there's never a disciple who was not baptized, right? Well, we have no evidence that Peter was baptized. We have no evidence that Matthew was baptized. The only apostle we have evidence of being baptized was Paul, right? Right, you with me? Yeah, I'm mm-hmm. on you. Okay, so in John chapter 20, and if you say that you receive the Holy Spirit through baptism, that's it, like that, but boom, that's it, right? Well, let me read you John 20, when Jesus rose from the dead, and he comes to him, he, he talks to him, he says, Peace be with you, as the Father has sent me, even so I'm sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Hmm. So they didn't receive the Holy Spirit through baptism. They received by Jesus Christ breathing it into them and give them this download of information to write the rest of this book. You know, And so I, I don't know if we can make the claim that there's never been a disciple who wasn't baptized. I believe that there's people in China today who, who don't, who they, they have one page of this book and they hear about Jesus Christ. They put their faith in him, right? And they don't know anything about baptism and they're killed. And even if the, all the disciples were baptized, they weren't baptized thinking that it saved them by their work. No. That's the assumption They don't as believe well. that that saved them. Right. That's but, the assumption too. And so in, like, let me clear that up again. I'm gonna, I want to be a fair assessment. Okay. Yeah. Now there are some obviously who believe that you like that's that's it you know but everybody's got crazy uncles i mean they could say so you know they could say stuff about us that like right. oh y'all believe all babies go to hell like no no we don't right, like right. whoa 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 where, where are you getting that from so everybody's got crazy people in their family but to give a fair assessment i don't i don't know any many people who would say that the water actually saves you they would say that but that's when you're saved right they won't say that that the water saves you but but when you say that it didn't take See, it gets confusing there. Right. Well, what didn't take? It was the water, right? This is why it's just well, that, so, such a confusing so, well, wouldn't thing. that bring into question then their original proof text to begin with at John 3, 5? 
that it's not the water that saves you, but that's the moment in which you are saved. Well, mm -hmm. Jesus mentioned water referring to baptism, but it is baptism, but it isn't really the baptism. It's just the time when you're baptized that is the case. Yeah, I don't think that the water in John 3 is talking about baptism right, or water. Right. I, mean, I think it's talking about the water that God does in our heart when he sprinkles us with yep. water and he puts his spirit in us to cause right. us to obey him. Which is Titus right? 3, verse 5. Right. Talked about not by works, but righteousness, but according to his mercy, say this, but about by the washing, yeah. regeneration, renewal of the Holy Spirit. Of the spirit. Holy Spirit, right? Yeah. And that's what the apostles say here in Acts. They're talking about how they remembered, like when they were in Acts 15 here, they're like, man, we remember that Jesus said that, you know, that, John baptizes with water, but I'm, he's going to come and baptize him with the Spirit. Dude, we saw it happen with the Gentiles. It came on them just like it did us mm -hmm. when we had faith. We saw it happen. This is amazing. So that's what's really going on. Mm. Um, so her question, I would say that there have been many disciples who probably died who weren't baptized. You know what I'm saying? I, I believe that when we're saved by faith. Right, and and she or, or not. And I just mean, to clarify, she's not Church of. She yeah. clarifies she's not Church of Christ. I think she just wanted to see what's our right. side in comparison right. to the Church of Christ. Now. And I was about to say, You're I don't know what now. what she really believes, but she would. Uh, I guarantee you, whatever she is, because it doesn't matter who you are. People say you're saved by faith. Mm -hmm. But the question is, do you really believe that? Right. And this is where the rub happens, because here's here's the scary thing. Okay, this is what happens with fundamentalist groups. Fundamentalist groups are the best at community. Right. And so if you show them this and they're built on these things. Right. And they say God's sovereign. He's in control of everything. You're saved by faith through grace. Right. You know, all these things. Christ alone. They'll say all those things. But when you really press them on, do you really believe that? And they realize that they don't really believe that. And that's kind of a scary situation. Now you're in a very scary spot. because You're like, oh, my goodness, I'm seeing things I've never seen before. It makes way more sense. But if I accept this, I'm going to lose the community. Mm. I'm going to lose my position. I'm going to lose friends because I've, <laughs> I've seen it happen now. I've seen people lose friends. I don't want to lose friends. I don't want to lose, lose the spot I have, the name tag I carry. And so what you realize is the idol that's really worship is not the truth of God's word. It's the community. Wow. And that's yeah. the sad thing. But that's not, and I'm not just picking on, that's any fundamentalist group. I mean, you, I mean, y'all do this show. I mean, you see it. I mean, y'all hear that all the time. That, right. That what's, what's the price to get out of a fundamentalist group? You lose the community. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, y'all, y'all do the, some crazy, crazy stuff. Yeah. That's yeah. and, and and essentially, when you lose the community, you're essentially also being damned by that community, mm -hmm. saying you've also lost salvation. And you've seen this on your other like, other uh, denominations, religions that you do. And if if you were the part of the one true church, right? If you're a part of the one true church, and you find out, oh my goodness. Well, there's nowhere else to go. Why? Because everybody else is wrong. Yeah. So there's no, like, so heck with it. I'm going to go live crazy and just, I can't, you know, I'm done. Right? Mm. Because it's the, the brainwashing of, like, you're part of the one true church. Everybody else is wrong, you know, and we got it. I mean, we restored the church. We're part of the restoration movement. We restored the one true church. Yeah. And so there's, where else do you go once right. that's been dripped in your head your whole yeah, life? Yeah, and as well, I think it's one of those things too. You know, as we're covering up this, we've gone. I think we're we're around, you can believe we're I think we're around the two hour mark. Like two hours about. and ten minutes, I think. Yeah, there. something there's like that. No one else listening. <laughs> <laughs> and I but, want to eat some of that food, Isaac. I know we're looking. I, I, our producer Isaac is over here. At one point, Isaac is a. By the way, Isaac is a plethora of wisdom. Name. Yeah. At some point, we're going to get you we to come on the podcast. Him. He's shaking his head. You are. You sit down there and you talk and you, you're like this wise sage. You're way beyond, you're way beyond your years. You're way beyond the few gray hairs in your beard. <laughs> but, um, I, I think it's, uh, yeah, you're, we're admiring your food over there. I think we're gonna, getting kind of hungry too. But I just want to make a point too that, again, we talked about earlier that we can only really give an account for a cult or a cultish group through a biblical worldview and giving an absolute standard for right. the source of this theological hurt. Because here, you might have someone who is involved in a group like the Church of Christ, and they leave and they are shunned and, and whatnot. But again, this that ultimately is the source of it comes from this theological distortion. But if you're going to start at, you know, the hurt or the, the, the cult trauma, uh, you are really falling short of giving an ultimate accounting of why that's an issue to begin with. Mm -hmm. But also to understand that when we're doing this, we're not just having a Bible study with, with a cultist. And this, is, this applies for any of the groups we've talked here on cultish. This is about people experiencing the spirit of the, the, spirit of the Lord where there is freedom but also realize that for many people, we have to realize that this message comes with a weight 
salvifically that these people would come to have the be in the real rest of Christ, yeah. but also the fact that there is, uh, for many a people, even though we still, for the time being, have it well here in the United States, for many people, you mentioned, you know, when you talk about getting ostracized or shunned or not being able to be part of the community or a group, for many cultists, the count the cost that Jesus talks oh, about yeah. becomes very real very quickly. So maybe just, what are your thoughts on that? Oh, there's so many thoughts on that. I mean, I think of John 12, it says that the Pharisees knew it, they believed him, but for fear of the other Pharisees, they didn't want to say anything because they didn't want to get kicked out of the synagogue because they loved the praise of men more than the glory of the Father, right? And so it's this whole, like, that's this, like, what, what I see is it's, it's normal. I mean, that, that, that's happened all the way back here with the Pharisees, right? Mm-hmm. And like, when, when somebody leaves a Baptist church and goes to a Methodist church, you don't see people splitting over that. You know, right. Presbyterian about like nobody's cutting off families over that, but you see a, you know, Pentecostal, Mormon, Church of Christ, stuff like that. I mean, it's cut ties, done, stay away from them, protect the community. It's all about the family. We're all one family, and you know, like not just like a, the mom and dad and kids. I mean, it's the church, it's the family. You got to protect them, stay away from them. I mean, it's like, but you don't see it when you're in it. You know, you don't you don't see that when you're in it. When you get out of it, you start seeing it. Like that's just that's not normal. When someone leaves and goes to a different church and says, look, you know, I might believe a little bit different. It's not like cut them off. I don't want to see my grandkids anymore. I mean, come on. And so what happens is, look, what was the question? Because I was, I got off on that. And then I was was making a point here. From the lady? No, not on the lady. Uh, Let me pull it back up. I I lost my my phone timed out here. Here's what I I want to uh, point out is when you... Back to kind of what we talked about earlier, the Old Testament doesn't really apply to us anymore. And, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are actually Old Testament books. John 5, Jesus says, How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? And then verse 46, he says, For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. Mm. But if you don't believe his writings, how will you believe my words? And so how do you believe Jesus when he says whoever believes in me will be saved? You don't even believe Moses. This is what Jesus says right here. Look, and then Luke 24, I love this. In, In verse 25 of 24, Jesus says, You foolish ones, slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Who's that? That's Old Testament. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter to his glory? And he beginning with Moses, that's the first five books of the Bible, and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. That's Old Testament. Mm-hmm. It, it matters. It matters, guys. You know? Yeah. But when you're growing up, it's like, ah, I don't really matter. Dude, come on. Please, listen. It, I mean, it even has to matter, right? Like Acts 17, 11, when Paul is speaking to the Bereans, he commends them for saying they're more noble than those in Thessalonica because when he came to them to preach to them, they searched the scriptures to see that whether what Day Paul was night. saying was yeah. so. And what, what were the scriptures that Paul's referring to? Right. The Old Testament. Well, yeah, well, that's that's really good. And then uh, go, go ahead and give your last thing because we, yeah, we're kind of on the verge of wrapping up. What was the last thing you no, wanted? I could go. I could just more of that. More of that. More of that. Okay. Well, we might do a follow up. We'll just we'll see if we can maybe do a Q&A and do some like uh, additional follow up yeah. questions for, for sure, because uh, I'm sure we're going to get a lot of inter- interaction from this. But just in general, um, you know, as we're doing it, we, we want to get to the point that this is we're all the part, whole purpose behind this is that we want to you have a real burden in heart. And this is this was your life for 18 years. And. And now you see things from a very different vantage point. But just mm-hmm. maybe in summary of all the conversations you've had, and you've had people that are that you love and care for that are in close proximity for you. This is not in any way judging from afar. This is people that you're reasoning with mm-hmm. in very close proximity. If you could just summarize, just maybe two, to, like two to three minutes, if you if for someone who's listening in, who's in the Church of Christ, and say they they kind of have their arms crossed, or they're like, I got to figure out a way to refute, you know, <laughs> what Trey's saying and whatnot. Just as we wrap up, maybe you spend you know two or three minutes to tell them like what, if you're going to talk to anyone right now and say they've listened all the way through and some of the things you're talking about, just what would you say to them as we wrap up here? Oh, I'd say read you know what I, I I tell them what what we tell our church every Sunday: read the Bible, but read it slowly. And when you think you're reading it slow, read it slower. You know, <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, for sure. Slow down, read, ask God what is He saying here? Does this make sense? Do I really believe what this is saying? You know, like and 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 I. I because I really believe that the power is in the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
And now, again, they would say that, right? They would say that. But guess what they really believe? The power is in the messenger. You know, I was guilty of it. I mean, I would say, like, man, if I could just get this person to share the gospel, oh, we would get him then. Mm. If I could just get this person to share it. See, you believe the power is in the messenger, not the message. No, y'all, read the word. Read the word. Mm -hmm. Just read it. And when you read it slowly, slow down and read it slower. Yeah. And just look at what God's telling you. That's mm. it. Mm. Oh, awesome. Well, I, I appreciate you coming on, man. Me too. Uh, yeah, this thanks was, for having me. This was a blast. And, and this is one of the things, too. This is, uh, you know, you do prep for a podcast and you, you talk about it, you work it through, and you don't really know what you're going to say until you say it. But one thing, too, it just always just flies right by. And I'm sure both on our end and on your end, if, you, if you've listened to us live, uh, go ahead. And uh, I'm sure you uh, would say the same as well, too. But if you enjoyed this episode, uh, go ahead and feel free to go ahead and add in the comment section any thoughts that you have. Um, and obviously, there are only a couple of people who are on asking us some really good questions and interacting with us uh, as we are here in Tennessee. Uh, this will be on our podcast officially in a couple of weeks and uh, sometime in October. And at that time, definitely by the time you're hearing this, uh, definitely uh, comment on our social media. Let us know what you thought. And as always, a program like this cannot continue without your support. So if you've enjoyed this discussion, and many other uh, continuing conversations we are having on Coltish, uh, you can go to thecoltishshow.com. You can go to the donate tab, uh, donate one time or monthly. And uh, for all that being said, thank you all for hanging out. Uh, Trey, thanks for coming on again, man. We appreciate it. And uh, we'll have to do this again sometime. Uh, we will talk to you all next time on Coltish, where we enter into the kingdom of the cults. Talk to you guys soon. God bless.